as Bill Parcells would call it, you, you can't chase car. You know, don't be a dog chaser or a car chaser. There's a dog ruler every time a car goes yeah, by. You're, yeah, you're oh. talking about the second touchdown pass of Sammy No, Watkins. the first one. Watch it again. Call me tonight and apologize. And now that he's off the phone, I'm definitely going to say he's wrong. Did you apologize? No, I was right. He was right. He's 64 and senile. I'm 38 and sharp as a tack still. He was wrong. We're not going to tell him that, but either way. He's uh, probably listening. <laughs> yeah, maybe not yet. He's not on the phone yet, but I don't think he's <laughs> listening to the podcast too much. Don't have to worry about that. What's up, everybody? Chris Sims Unbuttoned, episode number 67. The Bearmeister's here. It's the film deep dive, okay? Um, I know... I got my notes to you a little late today, so That's I know right. you didn't get to dive into them to the full effect. But yeah. we got a good one. We're going to break down a number of games, okay? Uh, Browns, Jets, Saints, Rams, Steelers, Seahawks. We're going to get into that. 49ers, Bengals, Ravens, Cardinals. And then I had to watch the Chiefs offense versus the Raiders defense because it's like it's dessert. It's porn. Right. It's porn for football. <laughs> for an ex-quarterback, it's like amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it truly is. Uh, and then we do have my dad. The big f- will be on here in about 25, 30 minutes. We'll get him on. And of course, I want to ask him about Eli Manning. And uh, I still remember the day my dad was told, not that he wasn't going to be the starter, but that he no longer was going to be on the Giants altogether. And we'll go. We'll do a little visit down memory lane and see if he remembers exactly how that unfolded. What do you remember about that? Day? Oh, I well, I just remember it was totally caught me off guard. Had no idea. Came home from school. He didn't say anything to me. We were hanging out. Blah blah blah. You're in what grade? I'm in um, eighth, uh, seventh grade. Okay. End of my seventh grade year of co- of uh, you know school. There. It's the end of June, and I remember sitting in my room. And it was like late, in, you know, not late at night, but let's say nine o'clock at night. I think I was like playing some video games. And my dad came into my room. He barely, very rarely came into my room. And then came into my room and like sat on a chair just like this and kind of sat, leaned back. And I was like, damn, what's he doing? Is he about to say something to me? And <laughs> he told me, he's like, Christopher, because I think he knew I was going to take it hard, mm-hmm. um, which I did. I, I hated the Giants for a few years after right. that. I went full-fledged Cowboys fan. I like Troy Aikman, <laughs> and it just gave me a reason to really go liking Troy Aikman. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was bitter for a little while. So we'll talk to him about that. Not an easy day for Eli Manning, as we know. But let's get into it. You ready? I'm ready. Ready, set, go. Here we go. Browns, Jets. Browns, Jets. Might as well start with the sexy side of the ball because the that other be side Baker's wasn't that side. sexy. Yeah. Yes, yes. And to be honest, that side wasn't that sexy for, for quite a while. No, it, it right? was not. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Browns' defense dominated the game. And then, of course, when Trevor Simeon got hurt, it was kind of night-night Jets. Right. Um, okay, here's the first thing with the Browns, okay? I think if I just had to go down here more than anything. Uh, again, it, like I said in week one, Browns got to be got to be patient with the run game. They got to. I saw a common theme with the week one game against the Titans that I saw with the Jets once again, which is a lot of disguises, a lot of people at the line of scrimmage um, before the snap, and then bailing out, right? Because right now we know the bread and the butter of the Browns is the receivers mm-hmm. and Baker Mayfield, right? So there, I, I feel like for the second week in a row, we saw a game plan by a defensive coordinator that pre-snap was like. Oh, it looks good to throw the ball, doesn't it? It looks juicy. It's one-on-one with Odell and Jarvis. You're going to torch us. And then as soon as it's blue 45, blue 45, set. As soon as that, all of a sudden it all disperses. And they're calling a pass play because they're going, oh, my gosh, we're going to crush them. So that's why I say be patient with this. Uh, And, again, there was a number of plays, I'll just say once again, where, you know, three-man rushes on third down, where it's third and three, third and four. Take a page from New England's book. Run the ball. Don't be afraid to do that. Don't let these teams keep baiting you into, like, being obsessed with what you're obsessed with all the time. And before you get to any of that, the the first things you write down, Browns offense, Jets defense, I like the Browns run game. I do. I'm a big fan of the Browns run game. It's not like you've got to the point where you're like, God, would would they run the ball a little bit? I might like it after seeing all this disguising. It's It's it's, the first thing you notice. It's it's the first thing I noticed. I liked it in week one, too. They just didn't do it enough. And it was one of the things I loved about Freddie Kitchens last year. He came in and said, we're going to get underneath center. I'm going to smash your face in a little bit. And Mm -hmm. they have guards who can, you know, pull and block people. Antonio, Cush, they can do those things. Uh, They're a better run-blocking O-line than pass-blocking O-line. That's what I was going to ask because I'm thinking back to conversations we've had about the Browns. Right. And the one concern you had was the offensive line. So why do you like the run game but you – 
Raise your hand and say, you know what, I'm not sure about the O-line. They're, they're still kind of raw a little bit on the O-line as far as like, hey, Greg Robinson, he's kind of just getting his feet underneath him as a left tackle in the NFL and, and getting used to playing football and being that kind of guy. It's things like this, stunts, they're not always the greatest of passing off. Or, you know, here I'm an offensive tackle and the defense end dropped out and now the nickelback's coming off the edge and, you know, just not quite quick enough to recognize it and then pop out and get that nickelback off right. the edge. Little things like that, which I think will clean themselves up, certainly, but uh, it's still a little work in progress. And w- within that, you know, you have a run- they have a running back who's – he's a beast. I mean, he is. Nick Chubb is a beast. He can do some special things, and I just think it'll make – Life easier on their offense, and it's going to make defenses be scared to disguise it. As you know, right? Yeah. Think about it. You got everybody at the line of scrimmage, right? Right before the snap. Then it's set hut. They all turn around to go bail out. If there's a run game behind it, you know, there's going to be guys, whoa, right. that are not going to see. <laughs> Yeah. They're not going to see the ball or see the run, and you can gash people when you do do that. Right, and yeah. if, if, if the call is a run, you have to kind of know what's going on up front, but you have to know less as a quarterback in the run. So if you're a little bit fooled, it's okay it's in okay. the run game. Oh, gosh, they have one extra guy in the yeah. box. I mean, how dare I ask Nick Chubb to have to break a tackle or make somebody miss? If you're exactly. a little fooled consistently in the passing game, then that's, you can that, that's get, a different issue. You're exactly right. That's yeah. disaster can happen, like we saw last week. Three interceptions in a row and three subsequent right? drives in a row or bad sacks and things like that. Speaking of Baker, yeah. I've highlighted here, Baker still, a few plays where he is jumping for no reason. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is something you don't – See from other quarterbacks. Yes, just jumpy. Just I meant jumpy. If I wrote jumping, just jumpy. Well, he, where kind of hyper, hyper. Like um, I, I, you know, one play that certainly uh, sticks out in my mind. There was an Odell. They were driving down one time. Odell was coming on a deep cross, and he's got Odell on the deep crosser. But he kind of like runs up in the pocket and like throws the ball with his feet everywhere, and the ball sailed over Odell Beckham Jr.'s head. Yeah. And it just again didn't matter this week against the Jets, mm-hmm. but. It might matter when you're playing the Ravens or the Rams on right. Sunday night when right. every play is going to matter and you're not going to get away with that stuff. So, yeah, there was just a few plays like that that, um, yeah, he's just got to be a hair more patient in the pocket. And, and um, you know, his patience was better this game than compared to last game where I thought there were some times where there were some three-man rushes or there was nobody around him and he was moving for no reason. It was better, but it's still not perfect. Mm-hmm. And I do think that's he can improve. Now, the other thing that jumped out to me in the game and is the Odell effect. Which is? Which is, well, first of all, Greg, Greg Williams can say Odell who all he wants. Yeah. <laughs> the film said he knew exactly who he was mm-hmm. because it was, oh, gosh, what a safety over the top of Odell. Oh, gosh, what a safety over the top of Odell. Except oh, for the touchdown. Except for the touchdown, which they put a safety over the top of Odell. Oh, he just, they rolled that way. Okay. They tried to kind of do a little – Tampa 2, I don't think the linebacker got out wide enough underneath it to right. take it away, right. but they were rolling to cover 2. Well, he was completely out of place then. Out of place, and when you leave a little seam like that in yeah. that much area with a guy like Odell, it's see you later. But the effect is real with Odell Beckham Jr., and, and this is the thing that you know I'll say that, that really does. Um, there's a few plays in the first half that – uh, I thought if OBJ, there was some one-on-one coverage where I want to just go, man, Baker, if you see one-on-one with Odell Beckham Jr., you, you got to almost just favor him over anything because right. he's such a mis- mismatch at this point in his career. And like we talk about with any fast receiver, when you have a fast receiver and especially you beat them deep with the one-handed catch early, the DBs are scared shitless from that point on. Mm-hmm. And they just back off and outs are there and comebacks are there. And there was a number of plays that I think were there to be had but Baker worked the other side of the field for some reason, and I'm not trying to fault him for that. But, you know, I just think the, the effect of what he does in the game, and the, because of that, it's another reason I say to run the ball. Mm-hmm. Teams are scared, you know. So if you show them you're willing to run the ball, then, you're, again, you're going to get some of those favorable one-on-one matchups where he can scorch you and make some big plays. There's so many people excited to see this Browns offense, which is still kind of a strange thing to say. Right. I know it's only two games, small sample size. Yes. They were better game two than game one. Right. But after two games – Studying both, are you more frustrated or more encouraged by what you see in this group? I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. I thought it was definitely a step up in just their total play. And I know the Jets The Jets defense is not bad. It's a solid defense. Right? It's yeah. maybe not as good as the Titans, and I understand that. But uh, I thought they executed better. Baker was better. You know, they had uh, a little more patience with the run, like I said. 
And I think overall, yeah, it wasn't perfect. There's still a little bit of a work in progress, but I think we saw a few glimmers where we went, ooh, I can see where it could get special here, that Baker can kind of get on his game. And like I said, Freddie can just figure out uh, a way to be a little more patient and run the ball. Right. I think it can be really, really dangerous. Don't want to spend quite as much time with the other side, but yeah. that's offense, so many, so many issues right now, especially quarterback. Luke Falk looks to be the guy for now. Uh, so Jets offense, Browns defense, what's your headline? Yeah, the, the, the headline is the Browns defense is good, first off. I mean, it is. It, you know, I'll break the Browns' defense down like this. They're elite up front. I mean, they have three elite game changers. When you go Miles Garrett, Olivier Vernon, and Sheldon Richardson, they pop a lot throughout yeah. the game. And Ogan Joby in the inside there, their other D tackle, he's no bad player either. You know, the linebacker, the second level, Kirksey, Kirky, Kirksey and Sho Schobert, you know, I'm not going to sit here and go, they're Pro Bowl linebackers, but they're good players, and they're very athletic, Paul. So they have great range, sideline to sideline, pass game with tight ends or anything in space. They're never overmatched. They have an island corner in Denzel Ward. They have another corner who you can go, ooh, he can be on an island a few times a game too if we just, you know, if we don't overdo it. And then they have solid safety play. You know, they're not real deep. That's what concerns me, and I'm a big fan of Steve Wilkes. I mean, their defense for the second week in a row played pretty damn good football. Mm -hmm. You know, the first week, it was just that big screen pass that they right. let up. And for, other than that, it was pretty solid. Third down, they're phenomenal. I mean, their first two weeks, the offenses are three for 24 on third down wow. against the Browns. Right. So that tells you. Are they aggressive? Rush, what are they on third aggressive down? Aggressive and just the right splash of creativity. They don't overdo it. They're, uh, this is Carolina's defense that went to the Super Bowl, right? It's kind of like we're simple. Right. We know where we're supposed to be. We're never going to mess up. We're going to tackle well. And then if we get to the third down, we might do some of that double A gap. We stand there, and you don't know which one's coming, which one's going, or a few little creative blitz zones. So it's a great way of how they kind of have it blended uh, together. And, and I think that's – what did I write? The simple complexities is one of the things I wrote in my notes. Simple complexities. You said they're never overmatched. It takes my mind to next week. I wonder if they might be a little overmatched yeah, against what McVay wants to do, spreading them all out. It'll be definitely a different, a different test for them. Um, the one thing I give them a fighting chance for their defense at least is when you go and you talk about like their three corners, um, that's something I look at and go, okay, with Denzel, Greedy Williams, and um, damn, I'm blanking out on my third guy here. Um, hold on, I got it right here. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, blank out. TJ Carey, mm. yes. That's a pretty good three. TJ Carey, he's been a starter for you know a number of games through his career with the Raiders. And then the big thing I just think we got to hit on with them more than anything, Paul, is Miles Garrett. He's gone into rarefied air. It's official. Really? Yeah. He is in the convo. How with, rare? He's in the convo with Khalil Mack and Aaron Donald and, like, certainly the cream of the crop as far as NFL defensive players go. He is a game plan changer where you've got to be careful about leaving your tackle one-on-one -on -one with him too much. You've got to tell your back to chip to him. You've got to be careful even the run game because he will disrupt the run game too. And, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's been pretty damn good for the, the first two weeks. All right, Rams, I'm sure, concerned with him, thinking about him as they put their game plan together. Sunday night, Yep. Rams-Browns will be a fun one. We just hit the Browns. As for the Rams, let, let's start with, uh, as you said a couple moments ago, the sexy side, the Rams yeah. offense against the Saints defense. What do you want us to know there? Well, I, I think uh, a right, cool thing right off the bat, early in the game, Jared Goff kind of had the Super Bowl play that we all saw him mess up, right? Yeah. He messed it up twice to the Super Bowl. One of the first plays of the game, they ran the post with a deep cross, and he threw a perfect bomb to Brandon Cooks. And I was like, yeah, Jared Goff, there you go, man. Yeah. Like, just read it out. So that was great. Um, hey, the Saints defense is good. There's no doubt. Of, I mean, their defensive front, I should say, is good. Uh, I think the thing that I would say that concerns me about the Saints, just to go there a little bit, is they're too aggressive in the back end. They're, they're too much man-to-man. -man. They give you too many opportunities to make some big plays that way. It's been a uh, theme after a couple weeks. It does. It's, it scares me. Not just me. for that team, but something it, you've, you've seen from other teams. Definitely. Too. And this is a theme even for the Saints last year. I mean, this is why, I mean, their defense kind of, I think, you know, fails to be one of the top defenses in football because – they're, they're, I look at their zone coverages and go, I don't think they're that creative or well coached. And I look at their man coverage and I go, I don't think any of them are that great at playing man to man other than Marshawn Lattimore. And he's not even like top three or four in the NFL type category at this point either. 
What can a team do defensively that, that would be a creative zone? Because I hear zone. Yeah. I think a lot of people hear zone. They think, okay, conservative. Yeah. Well, creative zones to me are, um, one, game plan specific, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, we all got cover three. Okay, but great. But you got to play, you got to curtail to your cover three to the weakest matchup. And, you know, that's where I look at creative zones where I'll take a team like Buffalo or I'll take a team um, – like uh, who, who might even, you know, the Patriots or some of the, the Ravens, they're another great one where they will play zone, but because of their breakdown of the offense throughout the week, their zone droppers always seem to drop to the right spot where the right spots yeah. are. You look and you go here, there's, there's three receivers on this side of the field. Mm -hmm. And this is a not, a, this is a pretty cool concept. But damn, they got seven guys all around these three guys. And that's where the coaching throughout the week and the breakdown of the uh, opposing team really comes into play. And I don't really see that from uh, the Saints defense a whole lot. All right, back to the Rams offense, specifically yeah. against the Saints defense. I have highlighted here that Goff was a little careful, and you underlined careful in the first half. What do you mean? I, I thought there was a few chances to where he could have maybe forced the ball down the field. But I think, you know, this is where I give Goff credit. He doesn't get over aggressive or too antsy. I think he has a pretty good feel for the overall game to go. Okay, it's three, you know it's six nothing. They're not moving the ball really well. Why would I take a chance and kind of let them have a short field or do that? Or Drew Brees is out. Mm -hmm. Why would I try to force a ball in and let them have a pick six or an interception and give Teddy Bridgewater only 20 yards to score? Mm -hmm. Which I give him a lot of credit for. He kind of played it the right way in the first half and let the game come to him. And then in the second half, you know, McVeigh, what's so special about him is it's not complicated, but he's got good players, and McVeigh knows how to package it all together beautifully. And uh, I think that's what it ultimately comes down to, because once McVeigh gets a feel for how he's being attacked, he, start, he adjusts his package too. And that's when you start to see, oh, Cooper Cup over the middle, one-on-one, mm -hmm. -on -one, bam, whoa, big play. I mean, that's where he can just start to tear you apart that way. So maybe he doesn't need to be, he being gone, maybe he doesn't need to be that aggressive. No, he doesn't, because usually McVeigh's going to be aggressive for him at the right time. Like whether, whether it's that first half play call or another play call that'll be a design, like let's take a shot down the field. Um, I'm, so, I'm a little still concerned with the Rams off offensive line, especially with uh, their right guard, Blythe, Blythe going down, yeah. right? Yep. So that scares me a little bit. Um, and, you know, the, the, and don't get me wrong, the, the, the Saints run defense is real because of those, that D line. And the, 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 the Rams are smart. They attack the edge on the Saints defense in the run game. All their successful runs were outside. They were like, they didn't really even try to go up there. Exactly. They were like, the hell with it. Because yeah. the Saints were one of the best run defenses in football last year, and they just said, the hell with it. We're not going to do that. So it was a lot of toss sweeps, edge zones, outside run. And yeah, the Saints are big on the defensive line. Their middle linebackers are not that fast and don't have great range. And that's, of course, a special part of the game. Um, I'm going to see. Oh, the other thing I just always write, and it's really for the second week in a row, the Rams are like the Patriots. If they get the third and four and less, you just might as well move the chains. It's first down. Because McVay, is, he's going to dial up the right play on third down. They have too many ways to get four and five yards. You know, they're just too good. He's too smart. Goff's good enough. Their talent's good enough to where they get you in that scenario, you're screwed, and that's the end of that. Um, so I think that's what's impressive for them there. Uh, the other thing that always jumps out to me, and this will be a theme of our day too, Saints. Too many dumb five-man rushes. I'm just not a fan of five-man rushes, Paul. In what situation? Well, just about any situations if you're doing it too much. I like a five-man rush sprinkled in here and there. But when you're getting an offensive coordinator, first of all, five-man pressures, quarterbacks this day and age, they can figure out who the fifth guy is going to be and point the O-line there and get them all blocked up. So it's not that tricky. And then you're compromised on the back end. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a zone blitz with a five-man rush? Well, the, the zones are going to be that much bigger because there's one less guy. Oh, it's, it's a five-man rush and you're playing man-to-man? -man? Okay, go ahead. Play man-to-man -man against Brandon Cooks. Let's see what happens. Would you rather see I would lined see, up like a five-man rush and it's only three? Yes. And drop eight? I would rather see that kind of shit. I, I would, or, or rush six and just force the issue. 
like force the issue. But I think five is like, you know, kissing your sister. It's just you're not doing anything. And nobody wants to kiss their sister, okay? I don't even know why I said that, but it just came out of my mouth. Um, I was going to segue off of that until you said but that's sister. Yeah, just like, but that's, that's, I guess that's all I got to say there. <laughs> the Rams, the other thing that just jumps out about me too, mm -hmm. uh, Cooper Cup being back, it, the great value, of course we know he's talented, but – it's the, the filter down effect. They don't have to use Brandon Cooks and Woods on the inside of the offense now. Now they can stay outside. And, okay, you want to play man-to-man? -man? Okay, well, mess with that. We got these guys out here, and you're going to leave them at an island. Uh, you know, so that's where I think the flexibility was. When they lost Cooper Cup last year, they had to ask those guys to do some of those type of things, and it took away from the matchups outside, which hurt their offense in general. And before we move on, the other thing that's just always amazing about the Rams that we got to talk about, their special teams. Special teams win football games for the Rams. They're like the Patriots. We talk about offense and defense all the time, and I'm a prisoner to that too. But I watch Rams games week after week and go, man, we, I always forget because I go, you know, wait, how did they get down here for this drive here? How did they – a 26-yard drive to make it, you know, <laughs> 20 to 6, and then as I'm sitting there watching the film and I go, oh – Right. I forgot they had a 34-yard punt return when they had them backed up. So uh, that's just another thing that I think is always worth pointing out with the Rams. They usually win that phase of the game. What, why aren't the Rams getting more attention I know. and more buzz right now? I mean, has there been a conference champion coming back the next season to start undefeated? You're praising the offense. Yeah. Even though I think it can be better. Yeah. The defense, the special teams. If I said list three or four NFC teams that you're excited about, the Rams, I know the Rams aren't going to come up for I, most people. Yeah, you're right. I, and I think it's probably somewhat because of assholes like me who are like, I think we're going to see Super Bowl hangover and I'm not sure. And I got to see Sean McVay reinvent himself. And now that they do it, we're always like, ah, they're the Rams. We thought they'd win anyways. You know, I, but, but you're right. Uh, I give them a lot of credit. The Rams play hard. That's the one thing I just want. When I turn on the film every week, I go, man, they throw their bodies around with reckless abandon uh, on both sides of the ball. He keeps pressure on you with the way he calls plays. Mm -hmm. They got talent, and they're just they're just never phased by anything. And uh, I, it jumps out, and I really I do. I give them a lot of credit for the way they've started out the season. And I don't think they've played their best ball yet, but they're two and zero. Speaking of two and zero, before yeah. we move on, oh, we got to do Saints, L, Rams, Z, right? But yeah. I, I, I want quickly which unbeaten team in the NFC West do you like the most? Ooh, which. Um, I like them all. I really do. I mean, I think to like there is all. a lot to like about all of them. Uh, I, I mean, I think right now it's hard for me not to say the Rams. Okay. Yeah, they're a proven commodity. I really like the way the 49ers are going, and we'll get into that in a little yep, bit. Yep. Uh, but, but at the same time, um, I don't, I'm not in the trust tree with Jimmy G quite yet. Mm -hmm. And then Seattle, uh, I still think there's a little too much on Russell Wilson to make the plays, and their secondary scares me just a little bit. So that's why I would say I give the Rams uh, the biggest issue there more than anything. Okay, Saints offense, Rams defense. I've got a note here about what's happening, the latest Saints quarterback situation. But before we get to that, yeah. what did you see when they made the transition? Damn, there's through? a note, huh? So there's I don't a note. even know this. All there's right. a note. Okay, so don't even tell me yet. I don't okay. want to know. We'll react after this. All right. Okay, um, first thing is, um, first thing that jumped out to me is Latavius Murray is not Mark Ingram. Okay, that's the one meaning. thing, Harry, meaning that Mark Ingram is a bull in a wrecking China shop, okay? Exactly. Or, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he, you know, I just think we took him for granted for how hard he yeah. runs, the tough yards he gets. Oh, which it's, it's a four-yard gain, but Mark Ingram would have ran really hard and probably got six or seven Catching yards. Catching the ball well. Right exactly. Now, so. can do yeah. that, too. Yeah. Um, Rams defense, Dante Fowler deserves some credit. Dante Fowler, Dante Fowler looks like the number three pick in the draft in which he was the Jacksonville Jack. He was phenomenal in the football game. He was phenomenal in the Super Bowl last year. Mm -hmm. And he is everywhere. He's phenomenal in the run game. And you talk about a crazy mother f throws yeah. his body around. Yeah. Well, he classifies as that. Um, so he isn't just benefiting by how worried they are about 99. I mean, everybody know. is to a degree, yeah. but he's certainly taking advantage of it. It's not like he's getting like, oh, they forgot to block him and he's getting to hit the quarterback. He's still beating the shit out of the tackle okay. or doing stuff. Like, he's earning it. Um, is it. Some favorable matchups every now and then? Sure. But, yeah, I think that the, the Sioux replacement, Sebastian Joseph, first-year kid out of Rutgers, hmm. really athletic, disruptive. I mean – their D line, it's it's every bit as good as it was last year. I mean, maybe not this kid's maybe not the plugger Sue was to where he can hold double teams down, but I do think he's more disruptive in like shooting gaps and almost like a like a Malik Jackson that that uh, Wade Phillips had in Denver, right. uh, that kind of guy. So he might get moved every now and then. 
but there's a number of plays where he's going to win and shoot a gap and really like, you know, my favorite phrase, play up. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Aaron Donald's, it's just, it's, uh, he just takes games over. He just does. And he did this in this game. He had a number of plays, including the jamming of the finger of where he just, within that series, there was a four or five plays before that and after that where I just wrote, damn, just through a few plays, he's changed the landscape of the game and he changed the landscape of the NFC all in one play. Mm. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But he just goes through spurts where he just takes over. And if you're not sliding the line that way or whatever, I don't give a shit who you got at guard. You're just not going to stop him. It's, it's unreal. Anything you can do? Anything you've seen that works? No, not really, other than that you're going to have to try to slide that way to where you can, you're either your, your guard can get some center help. But they're masters, mm -hmm. especially in obvious passing situations, of finding defensive, game, defensive line alignments to where you can't double them. You know, they'll put, they'll put three defensive linemen on the left mm -hmm. and then put him one-on-one -on -one with the guard, and you just right. go, well, you can't do anything. You right. can't help him. You're screwed. I think the most recent and best example of the, the stat, sacks. I've always said it, it's, the, it's the most misleading. Just it because is. a guy has a bunch doesn't mean he's really getting it done the extent no. the way that number would make you believe. And if someone has zero, Aaron Donald has zero right. sacks, doesn't mean he's not affecting the passing game all the time. No doubt. That's where my f the play up thing came from. It became That should from, be an official step. I know, because it came from guys like Michael Bennett in Seattle who used to do the same stuff, mm -hmm. or uh, Fletcher Cox in Philadelphia, or Jadeveon Clowney, where I would go, yeah, people are bagging on them because they don't think these guys get sacks, but they were the best defensive player on the field for like, oh, six weeks in a row. Right. And uh, that's, of course, the case with this guy. Right, okay, we got to get into the quarterback thing a little bit. Yeah. With Bridgewater. Yes. Okay. Do you want to talk about how he did in this game before we get to – I think that would work best. Yeah, okay. Bridgewater was early on solid. Hey, it's a mm -hmm. tough situation, so I always give a guy a benefit of the doubt. Oh, I mean, hey, you get to throw – hey, we're going to throw you out there against the NFC champions and Aaron Donald. Have how fun. You do. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, okay, great. You know, so that wasn't easy. Um, I honestly thought he got worse as the game went along, mm -hmm. right? Lost control of football – uh, I do think he's a little too conservative with his decision making, which is always the knock of mine, even when he was in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's a, he's a game manager, so I don't know if he is the the going to hit the ultimate ceiling for what they can do if Taysom Hill was the quarterback. Okay, right, right. that's where I have a question about it overall. Um, but either way, it was solid. Right. It was solid. It was not his best performance. The, the, the Saints got outplayed. I mean, the Rams, the Rams played well on defense. Right. The Rams are a tough matchup for the Saints. Yeah. They are because they're fast, and because of that defensive line, they don't have to blitz, and they can cause havoc in the pass game that way, um, and that's where they give them trouble. The one thing they did I thought was really good where they got burned in the AFC championship, or NFC championship game. Remember Kamara had like the 12 catches yeah. in there? Mm -hmm. They did some creative things to make sure he couldn't get off this game in the passing game. They doubled him a few times when he came out of the backfield, or they had him bracketed a few times and like little zone coverages where the bright lights were on him and they're like you're not going to beat us we're going to make you throw it somewhere else so that was cool rams are such a zone defense i think that's the other thing that jumped out to me paul it is really i wrote like nine out of ten snaps are zone coverage is that bad it's not bad i got no problem so with they that. The, the the creative zone that you're talking they, about yeah they do exactly right wade phillips is creative enough and then they got two corners on the outside akeem and marcus peters who were yeah, they might be playing zone, but you better watch the f*** out if you're right. going to throw out routes and comebacks on all of them because they will jump one like it's man-to-man -man and take it to the house. So that's, that's where it's, uh, you know, really well coached by the Rams defense more than anything. All right, let me well, go ahead. What do you want to say? Go ahead. I was just thinking about Bridgewater yeah. still and wondering if, if you would have put him before the season in the top half of backup quarterbacks in the top 16 or in the bottom half. I probably would have been top 16. Really? Yeah, before the season yeah. or leading into the season, not after I saw preseason. So before preseason, I probably would have put him in the top 16. Okay. When I saw preseason, that I would have teetered because he was not good in the preseason. And now, now that you've seen him in the regular season? Well, now, I mean, one of the one of the things I wrote more than anything here and just one of my defining statements, I wrote the biggest thing for me in the Saints is how can they find a way to get some big plays? Rams took away all the Kamara stuff, and Bridgewater is not a playmaker, you know, or, you know, just doesn't have the experience in the mm -hmm. offense to take advantage of some things that maybe Drew Brees can, right? Don't you think it's more that he's not a playmaker? I do think it's more than that. That's, that's in his DNA. He's, yeah. He is a game manager, and um, yeah, he won games in Minnesota because they had Adrian Peterson, they mm -hmm. played defense, and he didn't screw the game up, right. but he wasn't winning the games, right. and I think there's a difference there. 
What are you about to tell me? Okay. I'm ready. A little bit of news. Tell me you're going to tell. Please tell me Taysom Hill's starting quarterback. Well, I mean, it's it's uh, it's somewhere it's somewhere in between. Okay. So this is what it says. Coach Sean Payton refused to name Teddy Bridgewater as the Saints' Week Three starter against the Seahawks. When asked if he has to limit Taysom Hill's usage in other positions now that he's the number two quarterback, right. Payton responded, "You're assuming he's the number two." Peyton said he won't make an announcement to the media as to who will start in Seattle. The assumption has been Bridgewater will get the nod, but his leash likely isn't very long after his dreadful showing against the Rams in relief of Breeze. So there you have it. What do you think? I mean, he, he's I, – I, I think he just needs to listen to what he's saying. Right? Really, pretty much. And, you know, you're playing the Seahawks and the Cowboys the next two weeks. Yeah. Taysom Hill gives you the greatest schematical advantages to win the football games yeah. and in some really tough environments. What part of anything that I just read says that Taysom isn't going to be? I, pretty right? much. I think you're right. I mean, I think he kind of might have just told us there that it, 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 it should be Taysom. Which Will he have the guts to do it? Ago. Yeah. Yes. Well, he certainly is leaning in that direction. It's, it seems like it, definitely. Yeah. And Taysom, as you know, I watched the film because when I was watching on TV and, you know, you're, we're watching two other games and get ready for the, you know, Sunday night football and all that. I was like, man, I don't think I saw Taysom Hill on the field in any packages today. He was mm -hmm. in there a few times. He right. caught two passes, I think, I believe, or maybe it was one. He was out there for a few others. Um, but he's just, he's a specimen. Mm -hmm. And like we talked about in the preseason, he showed enough in the preseason to go, no, he's, he's learned how to play quarterback. Right, right. And uh, I just think it makes sense. I, I do, especially against these two defenses. They're not going to beat Seattle and Dallas with conservative Teddy Bridgewater play. No, I mean, no. Put, put yourself in, uh, uh, in Seattle's defense's shoes, if, if that's possible. If you're someone who has to make a call on what they're doing, if it's Teddy Bridgewater, okay, if he plays well, they'll, he'll be 20 or 30 for right. buck 85. And it's all the basic Mike West Coast, Sean Payton stuff. We'll see. We know how to prepare it's for that. It's a lesser version of, of what they've been the last 13 years. Exactly right. Years. If it's right. Taysom Hill, it might be terrible, but it might be a really good version of something that you had no idea was coming. Exactly. I think you, what do you prepare? You got to prepare for a whole bunch of shit now right. if you're Seattle. You got to go, oh my gosh, the quarterback runs. You almost got to prepare like you're playing Cam Newton and Drew Brees because of that mm -hmm. offense. You're like, damn, we got to worry about Cam Newton runs and then Sean Payton dicing us up with, you know, all his creative ways to throw the football. So, uh, yeah, I mean, without saying it, uh, I just want to be like, uh, attention, Mr. Payton, attention, Mr. <laughs> Payton, listen to your press conference and just start the guy that you pretty much said you think should be starting there. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited to see how that all play, uh, plays out. Are we ready for Seahawks Steelers? Seahawks Steelers, let's do it. Seahawks, I'm sorry, the Seahawks defense, we're just talking about the Seahawks defense. Yeah. That works very well. Right. And uh, another quarterback change from New Orleans, we go to Pittsburgh, Mason Rudolph is going to make the start there. So, but it was Steelers offense against the Seahawks defense last Sunday. Yeah. What stood out? Um, I guess I'm just so underwhelmed by Pittsburgh's offense. And this is once they made the transition from Ben. Yeah, it doesn't Rudolph. even matter. Even with Ben, oh, it's, really? just, it's just nothing that I look at and go, ooh. Scheme because later yeah. and AB aren't there. Can't or? run the ball. Nothing to scare you at receiver. It's true. Um, yeah. yeah, they're not even protecting in the pass rush as well as I would have expected. Uh, I think that's what, what's equally is, is concerning to me about the game in general. You know, they did get underneath the center and try to run a little power run football, okay? Um, you know, James Conner, again, is a nice little player, but he's a step slow. And I know he's hurt, so I, 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 don't, even care, I don't even remember what the hell his final injury was. Um, but either way, yeah, he's a little underwhelming to me. I think they need to run the, uh, the Snell kid more mm -hmm. uh, from Kentucky. I think he looks like he has some juice in his legs and can like hit a hole full speed going downhill. But then the receivers, you know, Juju doesn't scare you. Juju's a middle of the field. I'm outside 50-50 jump balls. Ryan Switzer, I don't give a damn. Okay. Dante Moncrief couldn't catch a cold going bare ass through Alaska. Okay. <laughs> He couldn't do it right now. I mean, mm -hmm. the interception Mason Rudolph threw was off of Dante right. Moncrief's face. Mm -hmm. I mean, so uh, that's got to go. The, the only – I'll tell you, the two guys that jump out that they got to start playing more, number 80, Holden, and their, 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 their first-year rookie, uh, Deontay Johnson. Uh, those are the two guys that at least have some juice in their legs that can scare some people if they get one-on-one -on -one matchups. Yeah, Pittsburgh's offense. I mean, I watched just to, to take a look at, at, uh, at Mason Rudolph, how right. it looked. And 
It's a little bit hard to tell because it doesn't have that much around it. No, it's tough. It's hard to come down on him too hard. No, he he did he did he played well. I mean, he didn't. I'm not going to sit here and go, oh my gosh, it he was did, so great. He did fine. He did but, fine, right? You know, I'll, I'll be interested to see where it goes. I'll say this about Mason Rudolph. You know, INT wasn't his fault. He does have good presence. He's got good patience in the pocket. I mean, he's a big guy, and he wasn't like. For a guy that got thrown in there against the Seattle Seahawks and Jadeveon Clowney and some of those guys, he wasn't, like, looking at the pass rush. He was, right. like, a big soldier, just like Ben is, kind of just sitting there, like, okay, I'm going to sit here and look, at, look downfield. My thing is he just doesn't have a special arm. You know, and that's where I just wonder, you know, He's not going to dictate games is what he does throwing the football and making special plays like Big Ben can that way. he doesn't way. have the personnel around him to make it easy. No, he does not. And I think that's why they got to play the Johnson kid. Um, but, you know, there's just not a lot of power in his, in his game as far as that's concerned. And I wrote, I mean, his arm is average. Like Minshaw, Minshew down in uh, Jacksonville has a stronger arm to me than, than Mason Rudolph. And, Worst team in the AFC North? Yes. Oh, no, they're not. We'll get to the Bengals later. B Bengals are actually moving the ball. I know. They, well, they, this well, wait, this past game, yeah, no, yeah. don't worry. And when we get into their defense, so you're going to yeah. go, oh, my gosh. Okay. But, I mean, uh, I think overall I, I, I'm encouraged by what I see from Mason Rudolph. But like you said, I don't know if it's going to be like, oh, they're going to win football games. I just don't know. I, I can't imagine them going to San Francisco and beating them right now. San Francisco's D is pretty damn good. Right. Their front's good. Um, Seahawks, just to hit them before we get done. Mm-hmm. Their secondary does scare me. You know, they just they don't have any guys, and again, they get away with it because Pittsburgh, because you just said it. I mean, there's just nobody that scares you. But if they have to play the elite offenses in football, and they do have to play man to man or just change it up every now and then, they're scary. They don't. They're not very talented in the secondary. That's why if I'm Seattle, I am calling the Jacksonville Jaguars and going, "We'll give you our next two first round picks for Jalen Ramsey." You're, two? Yeah, it might be two, or we'll give you a one and a two. You wouldn't give two. But uh, I would mean, you give two? I don't know. I think I would give two. I yeah. don't think I would either. I would give maybe a one and a two for Jalen Ramsey because wow. I think you got like a guy that's going to be the best corner in football for the next okay. five years. Yeah, and that's pretty damn special. Mm -hmm. And he's in that Seattle scheme already down in Jacksonville. It'll be seamless. And I think that he's the kind of guy. Like, listen, if Seattle's in it to win Super Bowls, if they want to be the Rams, okay. They want to beat, like, the Cowboys, and they want to beat the Patriots or the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Yep. They better be able to play some man-to-man. -man. If they think they're going to sit there and play Seahawks coverage all game long against those offenses, they're, they're f fooling themselves. There's no way. So that's why I just would go. They were one of those teams I'd go. I'd be calling Jacksonville right now. So it, if you're uh, making the call for Jacksonville, would you really want to give him up? No, I would not. I mean – no, that's don't why they're making it two first-rounders. Don't gonna go. teams put up with players who are a little bit of a pain sometimes? Definitely. They're that good. Isn't he that good? Yes, he is that Just good. Just because he asked to get traded. Doesn't I mean, mean you have to, right? Don't, don't you sit him down. And, don't panic. Yeah, right. That's why they're asking for two first-rounders, because they're going to go, if you're, if you're going to take them from us, we're going to get something we want. Right. Now... You know, just why we're on that subject, yeah, if I'm Seattle, the Philadelphia Eagles, the Kansas City Chiefs, I wouldn't even be shocked if New England's calling. <laughs> What, well, who cares about your first round? You picks? said that they're loaded in the back end. They're though, loaded anyway. in the back end. I could see them trading some of their guys down there and going, "Here, we'll give him. you two corners. We'll take him back and we'll pay him the new contract and go from there." Yeah. But the teams I just mentioned there, the other thing, along with the Browns, who I would throw in that conversation, mm -hmm. they have money. Who's they? Like the Eagles, yeah. the Chiefs, the Seahawks, the Browns. They could pay him to be the top corner in football. They can do it. And if, if there are that many teams that want him, yeah. maybe they will get a pair they, of ones. They might. I mean, one of those, those teams should all think about it because they're in their window right now. And, okay, you gotta, I look at it as if you're giving two first-round picks, you're only really giving one. Why is that? Because the other one was Jalen Ramsey. Yeah. You're getting one of those picks as Jalen Ramsey. Mm -hmm. So you're giving the other first-round pick for it. Like, I'll take Jalen Ramsey for a first-round pick all day yeah, long. Right. Okay, now you're giving away another one. And you're betting that your team's going to be good, so it's going to be an end-of-the-first-round type pick anyways. Who gives a shit if you lift, miss the 30th pick in the draft? Mm -hmm. It's free agency. You can find other ways to get guys on your team. It's not a, like a, oh, gosh, we got to have the draft guys or we can't build our team. No, I don't look at it that way. Other side? Yeah, other side. Like little Russell Wilson? Yep. All right. I mean, he's earning his damn money. I know that. I watched a little bit of this this morning. I thought he looked – I mean, I've got the, – the bar is set very high for him. Yes. In and out of the pocket. Right. 
He is as on top of his game. I mean, only two weeks. Yeah. But he looks fantastic. Fantastic. Did you, did you see any, like, if you, if you had a yeah but with Russell Wilson? It's, it's yeah, but their offense doesn't do anything on the pass game. I just Sometimes their pass offense just looks like you guys run straight and mm-hmm. Russell will throw it perfect. Don't worry. Just run straight. Oh, there is something to that because there is. based off of listening to you the last yeah. couple of weeks, yeah. I watched the Cowboys. Boy, I mean, we'll talk about that down the road. Yes. Just as you have said with what they do with formations. I mean, it is a fun They put you watch. in a bind, the, the variety right? of things they do. Right. Formations and personnel is great. Right. Then I watched Baltimore, and yeah. we'll get to that. Yeah. Not quite as much as Dallas is yeah. doing, but they do a lot. They do lot. enough, right. Then I watch Seattle, yeah. and the, the efficiency is there. The points are there. Yes. They win, but it's like you just dial it back from an A with creativity right. to somewhere in the Cs. I, I think that's a very way to, good way to put it. You're exactly right. You know, they're going to run the ball. They want to run the ball, and they want to you know, establish that. And then they want you to bring eight guys in the box, and then they just want you to play man-to-man. Yeah. And they just go... Tyler Lockett's faster than your guys. Mm-hmm. DK Metcalf faster yep. than your guys. And Russell's an amazing deep ball thrower or back shoulder thrower. And they yeah. just go, we'll see how you want to do if you want to play that. And that's the kind of the game they play. They keep it simple. And then it helps even more when the Steelers go full Tropic Thunder and always do the <laughs> five-man rush. I mean, he threw three touchdown passes on the five-man rush. Wow. Yeah. Um, he threw – he ran – for the third and 16, they're trying to they're the, they're trying to run the clock out at the end of what the game. What are they playing behind the five man rush? Either man to man or a three deep zone, and they were hitting seams and go routes every time. That's it. When it was zone, it was tight end seam touchdown, tight end seam touchdown, great, you know. And then it was man to man. It was oh maybe an inside fade or DK Metcalf back shoulder or DK Metcalf bomb and. That's all they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, five-man rush, again, in the NFL, it's just okay once in a while. When it becomes like the defensive call one every three or four plays, it's just a matter of time before you get your ass burned. Right. It's just a matter of time. And added to the three touchdown passes, where at the end you can see I wrote WTF on the kind of the third <laughs> bottom of the – right? Yeah. Uh, and then I below that I wrote Russell F- Wilson, a.k.a. Bobby Big Play, okay, because mm-hmm. that's what he is. It's just right. big plays. I know. It's never dink and dunk. It's like – but third and 16, end of the game, they're trying to run the clock out. Five-man rush, Paul. <laughs> doesn't get home. He finds a scene. He runs up the middle for 15 yards. So the then time. they can go yeah. fourth and one, and then they go for it, and they get the first down, and the game's over. And I highlighted this because Seahawks fans, I mean, if, if this is true and it plays out this way, yeah. this is the best thing you've written. Rashad Penny looks very good. Really good. Not something you would have said a lot of in the no, past? No, no. I mean, no, you're right. Wanted we to. haven't seen it. Wanted to. Liked I did. Out of high, uh, college. Liked out of college. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, there was a, a few runs in the game where – he just has a, a, a bigger propensity to break big runs mm-hmm. compared to Chris Carson. I'm a huge fan of Chris Carson. Right. He's the sledgehammer, sledgehammer, sledgehammer. Rashad Penny is not quite that sledgehammer, but he'll run up into the, you know, into the pocket there and then, I mean, run up into the hole and dance and make a move and then go get 15 or 20 or make something special happen that way. So, um, oh, damn. Okay, hold on. we got to call my dad. Uh, <laughs> what do you I'm, say? Okay, but but yeah, that's the big thing that jumps out to me. He's like, you gotta call me. What the hell are you doing? So I'm. <laughs> Is totally, it past time? We were past time. Yeah. Um. Damn. Okay. But either way, he's gonna be unhappy about. The, it. Yeah, he'll be okay. <laughs> but the five man rushes are so stupid on Pittsburgh's place. They mm-hmm. still can't play man to man worth the damn to where I would ever go five man rush and go. Oh, we're just gonna go five one on one matchups. That's scary. Okay. Then they should learn their lesson from this game. They were one on one. They got their asses toasted. Right. And. Um, and then they lose Sean Davis at safety. Now they traded for Minka Fitzpatrick, and that's great, and that helps out. But Sean Davis is special, and you see him in this game. He is all over the field. I, Sean Davis is one of the better safeties in football for me, mm-hmm. and he's kind of was just coming on the scene last year, and now you know, here he's going to be out with a torn labrum. But, uh, yeah, I think overall, hey, I would like a little more creativity from the yeah. Seattle offense in the past game. Yeah. But because they run the ball and they're patient with that, it lends itself to some one-on-one matchups to where they do take advantage of it. Have they always been that way? Is this, is this They've new? always been that way, yes. The only thing I'll say that's new for them that they're better at than even compared. Now, their team's not as talented as when they were going to the Super Bowl and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But their run game is better coached now than it was back then. There's more diversity in their run game. When the Marshawn Lynch years, it was inside and outside zone. Yeah. And Russell keeping you honest with the read option. And... You know, they were awesome up front. They had, like, one of the best O-lines in football, and they had one of the best backs in football. So they could go, 
you know, hey, this is our run play. Right. Screw you. Right. You can't stop it. See if you can stop it. Right, right. Yeah. So is the old um, man's on the phone? What's up? Is he there? Is dad there? Uh, yes, I've been sitting here waiting <laughs> patiently for 35 minutes. Damn, dad, it really creeped up on me. Um, I'm really sorry. I did well, not. Well, if you'd shut your, hey, Paul, yeah, tell yeah. him there, there's a rule that you are allowed to shut up for a minute <laughs> to dial the phone. Damn, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, we're, we're doing, you know, it's my deep dive uh, notebook day and, uh, we, got a lot of stuff to get we to. We did here, a lot though. of stuff, and I got talking and rambling a little bit about the Seahawks and Steelers, and I lost my train of oh, thought. Oh, I haven't there. watched that game yet. Um, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to. Yeah, I guess I will. Uh, who's playing Seattle this week? I forgot. Seattle's uh, got the Saints, where. The Saints, yeah. Just, just so you know, okay, before I ask you your first real question, let, let, I want you to hear this, Dad, and your reaction. Sean All Payton right. at a press conference being asked about. His quarterback situation. Go ahead, Paul. Read it to him. When asked if he has to limit Taysom Hill's Taysom Hill's usage in other positions, now that he's the number two quarterback, Peyton responded, "You're assuming he's the number two." Said he won't make an announcement to the media who will start in Seattle. So there oh, you go. Well, um, my reaction is, I'm not surprised. Right. You would like to see Taysom Hill, right? It's not saying I'd like to. I'm just not surprised. I know what he thinks of Taysom Hill. Uh, we've talked about this. I thought Taysom Hill, as a quarterback in preseason, I was uh, – the word is exactly this. I was shocked at how good he looked at playing just the position. Right. And um, Sean Payton doesn't like him. He loves him. Right. And it wouldn't – you know, one day I can see Sean Payton getting, getting entirely away – not entirely, I'll never do that – from what he's doing and go into this new way of his version of what maybe Andy Reid and Baltimore even what Ravens. the Baltimore Ravens right. are doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Except he, he'll come up with even more ideas. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, when you're designing an offense or whatever, whatever your thought process is, you'd like to be able to do it and go, well, we don't have to worry about our quarterback because he can do whatever we draw up. Right. And that's a that's a big deal, and yeah. especially in this day and age when it's about what on offense. To me, big plays. Yeah, get it. You know, it's. I heard you this morning, Christopher. Really, a great thing you said. Um, I don't get it with so many teams in the NFL. Get your butt under the center. Yeah, I know. Well, let's get in the shotgun. Yeah. Here we are again. Yeah, right. Oh. We're going to fool you. The back is going to go across and counter back this time. Yeah. It's just, it drives me nuts. And deception, I could, I, I watch the, I'm watching the 49ers, you know, some of the things they do right. from under center and guys are running the wrong way on mm -hmm. defense and yep. this and that mm -hmm. because, hell, you know, it, it's new. It's almost like, Springing right. the wishbone on teams all of a sudden. Yeah, I know. That's just what I've been saying. I mean, to, kids are coming from college, and they're not used to seeing eye formation and fullback and pulling guards and tight ends coming across. Well, the, we got 215-pound linebackers. Yeah, right. You know? That, too. Yeah. Exactly right. 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 And, yeah, and I'm, I'm watching the game the other night, and I'm just going, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the Jets going, oh, my God, give it to Le'Veon Belmore. He's a pulling guard running. <laughs> right. right. He, it's, I, I tell you. It, that answers the question about Le'Veon Bell. Was he did the system make him, or did he make the system? And I do believe this, and you guys have probably said it. Running backs make offensive lines that are good. They make them great. Right, right. And it becomes look. I remember it as a player, Paul. You and Christopher were both quarterbacks, linemen. There's nothing like it would be for all of us. When you're physically dominating your opponent, there is an unbelievable power and faith and everything that comes comes with it. Yeah, and it's it's really uh, what's the word for it? It's like infectious through the team. I mean, well, it's infectious, but the defense is demoralized. Yes, That's what right. I'm trying to say because yeah. they're going, "Oh my God, you're whipping our butt!" Right. Mm -hmm. And I can remember we ran the ball in a playoff game against the 49ers, and Joe Morris is just slamming it up in there right and left. Man, it was heat fast. What, I we talking about 86 or 85? The 86 Which one? game. Yeah, right. And I remember, well, I was, Dwayne Board right. was getting down in the stands. He goes, oh, my God, are we this bad? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. You know, Dwayne Board was a great guy, 
and I played against him many years. But he said one of the linemen, you know, he just says, you get down, he goes, oh, my God, we're one of the worst teams in football. <laughs> I just something. I remember the lineman told me the story. I can't remember who it was, and I just laughed. I go, because he was, even when he would, like, run me over sometimes, he'd pick me up, and then, you know, he wouldn't be like, you know, F you or nothing like that. He'd just pick me up and be a nice guy about it. Yeah, so. all right. So we got to go there. We got to go to this anyways. All right, but so, hey, just to your final point, Saints this week, they got the Seahawks and the Cowboys. I'm starting Taysom Hill. I've been saying that. I'm going to say that. I think he gives them the best chance to win the game. I mean, oh, wow, with Teddy Bridgewater, you're going to run the basic watered-down version of Drew Brees' offense, and I just don't think that's going to get it done against these two teams. At least that's my take there. My take would be I definitely would start Teddy Bridgewater, get a feel for the game, let the crowd settle down because Teddy Bridgewater would probably be a little more uh, better for that situation just for the game to settle in. Hmm. And then once we see what we got, then I would not hesitate if it's not going well or if it's not what we expect to bring him in because he'll be settled into the game himself. And you, you know out there in, in Seattle, yeah. at the start of the it's game, crazy. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. It is. So, All right, that's a good point. Okay, I, I'm not going to say you're totally crazy. How dare you disrespect me in my own podcast and don't agree yeah, with me. Yeah, it's okay. Well, somebody's got <laughs> Paul's over there going, oh, yes, Christopher, that's so smart. <laughs> hey, Paul, come on. Let's it's go. week two. Speak it's up. early. Come on. It's All week right. two. We get, we've got a lot of, lot of season left, though. Okay, so we got to talk to you about, you know, the obvious thing, all right, the elephant sure. in the room. And you're, you're Johnny, Mr. Giant quarterback, all right? And, uh, of course, the, the Eli Manning and, of course, the switch to Daniel Jones. Um, right. You know, first off, just, you know, what were your thoughts when you first heard it? Surprise? What, what, what kind of went originally through your head there? Oh, originally, look, it, uh, we talked about it a little on air after all the games were over last week. And I just said, you know, we, we were talking, about, and I thought that they would give it, I really thought, one more week right. for Eli Manning. And if they didn't win, then I thought they would make the switch. And the reason is, again, I heard you talk a little bit about it is that they're going down to, yeah. you know, to Tampa Bay. Right. And I don't know if anybody's paid attention, Yeah. but Tampa Bay against the they're Cleveland Browns in their, their, what do you call it, rehearsal game? Right. Well, they just ran over Cleveland. Right. And they, Baker Mayfield couldn't do anything. And it's it just shows you, Todd Bowles, defensive coordinator, I loved him in Arizona. I never saw the Jets' defense kind of get that thing going. Then he goes down to Tampa, which I think is even less talent maybe that he's had some places. And they've been really good the first two games of the season. Yep. You saw them against the 49ers. They just smacked the heck out of them. They did. 49ers won it. They had two interceptions for touchdowns against Jameis and got just about every break you can get to win, to win the game. Right. And they were, of course, very good against Cam Newton. And that, So I thought, don't let Eli go down there just because of all that's going to go on. And we also talked about, and Bill Cowher said something to me, and I just said this, look, this offense, Daniel Jones was drafted because he fits this offense exactly what Pat Shermer wants to do. I heard you say that. Yeah, it's yes. a good point. And, right. and, you know, people, oh, Phil wants Eli Benst. And I'm like, okay, dummies. Oh, I almost said something else. <laughs> listen to what Bill Cowher said and listen to what I say. Oh, okay, that's different. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, but the – he, it's we saw the offense he ran in Minnesota. I loved it. Right. And what we'll see this week, I, I'm, you know, this is my guess. We'll see. Oh, the quarterback under the center more. Now we really will give it to Saquon and let him do it. And now get our play action passes and movement. And you can say whatever you want. The Giants' offensive line has played pretty well the first couple games. Right. And I, I heard some on TV go, well, I mean, oh, no, on radio here in New York. Oh, I keep hearing about all these great Pat Shermer ideas and all that. Let me tell you what. The Giants have been running some good ideas. Yeah. They, they had some good stuff against the Dallas Cowboys. That yeah. I went, wow, that was clever. And they got 35-yard gain out of it. That's pretty good stuff. Right. And, you know, the Cowboys are just a better team. And the, the big thing with the Giants is getting rhythm. Stand on the field and see if their defense can get off. That's that's one thing. Sure. But so it caught me by surprise in that respect. But I think they just realized and just said it, it's it's the fact that okay maybe they but James Betcher they've been going against that defense all spring. Yeah. And they even talked about how hard it'd been, all the blitzing and all that stuff. So they're ready for it. And the biggest thing is is like I said, under center play action passes. Movement of the quarterback, and I did this on Showtime about Mason Rudolph. 
of course he can't throw like Ben and all that. So right. they'll change their game plan and they'll be a little more conservative. They've got all the screen games and all the other stuff they do. They can run it and that their O-line can really protect. But he will scramble this week for yeah. three or four first downs, five and six, seven yards, nothing great because he's not quick. And it, it's – those kind of things make a big difference in today's game. So, yep. Phil, it sounds like you were surprised that they made this move, but once you got past that initial surprise, do you think it was the right move, the right time to go from Manning to Daniel Jones? Well, listen, Paul, you know, being an next player and all that, and, and, and I know it's it, what Eli's going through. I mm -hmm. do. You know, I've been there. We've all been there if you're a quarterback. And, uh, what difference does it make if it's this week? When's it going to be the right time, Paul? Well, it's, you know, that's it's never, always, no, it's never easy. I'm, I'm it, on board with it. But it's never that. the right time, and I understand the Giants fans. I really do. I sat there and thought about this yesterday. You know, they treat me great, the Giant fans, and they see me in public now. Mm -hmm. And I go, damn, how would they treat me if I'd have been part of that second Super Bowl and been the MVP? Yeah, right. My God, you know, right. I might have a statue outside that stadium. <laughs> I, you know, so... So I, I thought about that. So I understand. I think it finally put in perspective their feelings because he's such a part. Eli is such a part of so many people's, you know, feelings and grew up with him as a, the, the giant quarterback. Right. And that's a big group. And and you know, yeah, we won a great Super Bowl. It was great. We finally won one for the Giants. Then won a second one. But they beat a sixteen and zero or eighteen and zero Patriots team, right. which was I think I. Read in the paper, one of the mayors or somebody said, you know, the greatest victory in giant history or something like that, which it might be. Yeah. And, you know, they had some epic playoff games where they were supposed to lose and they won. So it, it's tough, but I think the Giants realize where they're at, what kind of team they are. And it's if all season, last thing I'll say, all off season, all you kept hearing, you heard it, Paul, Christopher, you heard it, the boy. Daniel Jones, he's really good at practice. He's yeah, really doing well. Right. And you heard it from Pat Shermer. You know, Pat Shermer's is like, it's even better than he expected. All this other stuff. So he fits what they want to do. And and the good thing for him is Saquon Barkley's there. And they got a pretty good offensive line in front of him. And, you know, it's time to start it. Because I think we see they are not a playoff team. Yep. Will Daniel Jones struggle? Well, of course he will. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that all creates some arguments, you know, but you just got to be tough and learn to live through those tough days and just keep working. And when you have a good day, it's you know, like I even said in the paper today, I read it, Steve Serby from the New York Post actually quoted me right. That was, I was really surprised. <laughs> That's not like him. Um, that was supposed to be funny. Yeah, because, well, <laughs> you take, you've done that before with Steve Serby. I've heard oh, that. Oh, good, because, yeah. you know, Steve Serby, you know, he's like, uh, uh, hey, uh, I don't know what day it is. What about the Giants? <laughs> <laughs> So he's a great guy, and, you know, it's hard to believe that he was covering – he started covering the Giants in 83. Jeez. So I've known him since then. So, but, uh, you know, yeah, it's not going to be easy for Daniel Jones, even though he had this terrific preseason, and he'll be judged really hard. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are some things to look at the Giants and be positive about. Yeah. The hardest thing to do is to, in the league, I think, is one thing. And forget the quarterback. We know that. What's the, what's the number one thing? What group? The old line, the old line. The league is about all about offensive lines. Yeah, hmm. let's just quit talking about it. it's the old. Look at Patrick Mahomes last week throwing. Yeah, right. Nobody around. Let me just him. cruise right. over here to the left. Oh, I don't like it. Let me just kind of cruise a few steps to my right. right. Oh, I think he's going to cross the field at sixty. I think I'll just throw it out there. Right. I mean, come on, <laughs> yeah. it was ridiculous. Yeah, it was. You're right. It was pro football, and you. It, there's nobody even close to him. And, you know, the Patriots do it a different way. I'll tell you, that's the great thing that Mason Rudolph has going for him. Ben Roethlisberger, I mean, they don't stop. They don't just protect the quarterback. They don't let guys get off the line of scrimmage. Yeah. That Pittsburgh Cedar offensive line is good. And so – uh, that's it. Any other questions? Well, I mean, uh, uh, last thing. I'm going to buy both of you a watch. I well, know that. Well, last thing. Yeah, we'll, we'll take it. Please buy me one. <laughs> you um, will. Well, I've already given you one. Uh, the, the, uh, do you think this is it for Eli? I mean, you, I, would, I would say so if you had asked me. But, I mean, I, I would think he rides this out as a good soldier, a good backup quarterback, does things to help the team and Daniel Jones. And, 
you know, uh, he'll get a, a nice send-off at the end of the season somehow with the Giants honoring him. But but I would. What, what's your thoughts there, Dad? Well, I would think so. Yeah. I would think so. I can't imagine Eli Manning coming back next year and wanting to be a backup to somebody to, you know, I love the word, to mentor him <laughs> and all that stuff. I love all that. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it will be. And, and um, you know, He's probably sitting there. Of course, today is going to be the worst day of his professional career, probably. Right. Go on to practice. I was there. You have no energy. Your thoughts are everywhere. He's going to have a hard time learning the game plan this week just because it's just hard to concentrate. Yep. And I'll tell you the first thing he said this morning as, he, as they had their first offensive meeting. You know what he said? What? Well, hell, where were all these plays when you I was know, playing? That's the truth, because you know huh? they're going to have all these new gadgets to make sure Daniel Jones gets off on a good foot. Right. And I remember this, the, you know, not that my career was anything like yours or, or Eli's, but I remember after I lost my spleen, the first meeting I went to, and Bruce Gradkowski was the quarterback, yeah. I went, I remember just going, what the f***? <laughs> if we had these plays... First of all, we wouldn't have started out 0 and 2, and I probably wouldn't have lost my damn spleen. Like I yeah, was that's pissed right. off. You wouldn't have got hit so much. I was so pissed. Yes. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. Still uh, mad about it. But that's a common theme. I talked about that even the last few years with like Carson Wentz and Nick Foles. Right. You know, Carson Wentz went out, and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, we got to help Nick Foles." And then I watch film of the Eagles, and I go, "Where the where the hell have these plays yeah. been the whole year?" And all of a sudden they're a part of the offense because we got to help Foles out. We got to jumpstart him. Well, how about well, you, you know, jumpstart the really it, good quarterback too? Right. Because yeah, that's you, what good you know, offense coordinators do. Is, Everything you're saying is so true. Yeah, and it's great to say it, but you know, it. it who absorbs it? And I, it just nobody absorbs that thought, which yeah. is a great thought. It's the truth, and wow, it really explains things. But you know, and you know me, I watch TV as I work and listen sometimes. But I've gotten to where this year I've listened less and less because I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. If I have to hear that one more time. You know, oh, let's talk about Dak's contract one more time. Right. Oh, boy. I mean, it's hell, I could work for the rest of my life with some of these people. Because all we're going to talk about is Dak's contract and what do you think about this? And there's like three subjects. That's all we talk about. Right. Right now, you're it's right. True. It's, it's ridiculous. But what you say there is so true, and we need more people to say it so the public understands. Right. So they don't go, oh, the, they should get rid of Carson Wentz and keep Nick Foles. Well, what, are you, crazy? Yeah. Did you see Nick Foles on Monday night? I mean, come on. Was that Monday or Sunday? That was uh, Sunday night. Was Sunday. Yes, Sunday night. Yeah. I mean, how many guys Carson could have Wentz taken that on Sunday night. Sorry. Yes, and right. made those throws? Right? right. No. They were unreal. Very impressive. They were, it was unreal. Yeah. It was, it, you know, I was going, oh, my gosh, here we go. It's and, you know, Philadelphia, same thing. Get his ass under the center Please. once in a while. Holy crap. Shocker oh. every freaking Give play. Him Drives me crazy. All right. All right. We're done with you. All right. I feel better. Thanks for get, getting back to me. I, I honestly I I thought, well, I guess they're not going to call me. They're so pre-absorbed with, their, or with themselves. <laughs> yeah, that, um, you know, they weren't going to call me. Phil. So, yes, one, Paul. One anecdotal question here about a half hour ago. Maybe it was longer ago. Chris was telling the story about when the day you got released from the Giants, I think June of 94. He was yes. up in his room. He's in middle school. He said, Dad comes up. He didn't come to my room very often. He comes in, shuts the door, and sits down. And we never got to what Phil said to you and how he explained it. When you yeah, well, yeah, do you remember the day? I mean, I mean, do I don't know if you remember all that. but well, I, I remember coming up to your room. I can't remember exactly how <sighs> I told you. Yeah, well, yeah, no, I mean, it was nothing, you know. Was he, was he pissed? Did he cry? No, he, he was really calm about it, too. Yeah, That's I, was. I was like, damn, I, I was thinking, like, did I do something wrong and I'm about to get in trouble? It was one of those kind of, <laughs> oh, like, feelings, okay, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, and, you know, uh, that tells me you probably did something well, wrong. Well, probably, so. yeah. Who knows? I mean, I stole a $20 bill from you or something, <laughs> something like that. But either way, uh, yeah, he said it, and he kind of just said it matter of fact. And I was heartbroken. I felt like I was more heartbroken than Dad. Mm -hmm. You know, I was. Well, uh, no, listen, listen. Yeah. I just, I was dumb to it for a long time. And I remember pulling up in front of the house, and I walked in. I said, Diana, you won't believe what happened today. Just like that. And she goes, oh, my God, who died? Oh. And I said, I go, it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, the Giants released me. And, you know, she was really, you know, well, you know I'm just going to be honest. My wife to this day is still upset about it. Yeah. About it. I'm and still I go, upset, God, too, let some it go. days. I have a hard time letting it go. I well, do. no, you know, it, it's, it's <laughs> maybe it's a great thing yeah. because 
It kept me from playing two more years and getting beat, getting beat up more. But the only thing I'll say to that is it took me a long time. But, you know, my 15th year of playing, I probably took less hits than I ever did because I started playing the new way. Right. You know what? I'm going to throw it away. Get rid of it. Right. And, you know, I, it was kind of like, you know, when it's out there, run, fall down, whatever. And, you know, Dan Reeves is there, throw it away. And I was like, damn, you know, I never heard that before. Usually, stand there and throw the ball. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe I, I definitely would have changed. I was changing the way I played and was taking check downs more than I ever did. And wow, it was pretty good, you know. So it got me to the Pro Bowl. Yeah. Uh, but whatever. But it was a long time ago. Maybe it was a good thing. Just it saved my body a little bit. And, and you were really now, so. the first sal- first major salary cap casualty, really, in the history of the NFL. I was telling Paul that. I mean, you Yes, know, I was. Yeah, it was the first one. It was the first starting free agency and all that. And Dad was really the first marquee name mm-hmm. to get released because of that. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I, it was almost. I think I might have been the very first one. I'm not sure. And I remember, you know, the players' union wasn't very kind to me either about the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you know. They were because it was a fight with the quarterback club or something like that all going on then, and you know so they were jerks about it. But that's that's how it goes. Yeah, that's how it you know, goes. Player, you, hey, way to pick up for me, thanks guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can I, I can put a tag on it this way because I'm not related. Phil was he went to the Pro Bowl the year before, which in '93 when going to the Pro year. Bowl meant something, right? Right. And a lot, right? And they were 11 and five that year. 11 so. and five, and yeah. what a playoff so that's game. That. What when a we playoff were we game. were within a whisker. Maybe one drop pass of beating the Cowboys yeah. and getting a week off and playing a home game, which would have changed everything. Right. right. You know, when we lost that game, and I knew we were going to play three playoff games to get the Super Bowl, I said, well, we have no chance. Yeah, because you knew you are going to have to play Dallas and the 49ers on the road. And the 49ers too. in their place. Right. If we beat one, we have to play the next one. So right. that was not going to work. But yeah. that was a great game, the Cowboy game. I remember like it was yesterday, one of the most fulfilling games I ever played because it was over. The Cowboys were so effing good right. that I couldn't believe we played them so well, took them to overtime, and when the game was over, I was not unhappy. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah I was like, hell, we did the absolute best we could do. Right. And I, this is a true story. I'll let it go with this. I walk, walk it out with you. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. I remember the Cowboys, I think, were thrilled. I mean, they were also amazed with how well you played in the Giants, too. And they came out and sang Dad's praises right in front really? of me. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And, you know, Jimmy Johnson comes out and talks to me. I said, man, Jimmy, you guys got a great team, and you're going to win the damn Super Bowl. All right? You're going to win it. And he goes, well, you know, I said, no, you're not. Jimmy, you're going to win it. And I said, if we get to see you again, that'll be great. And, you know, but I don't know. <laughs> I think I did. I said, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, because I just knew we were going to have to win two playoff games to get to them. Right. And uh, he was really cool about it. He, and Rich Dalrymple, their PR director or whatever, was there too. And he talks about it all the time. They just couldn't get over it. They got done. They go, damn, that was great. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that uh, was cool. But you were standing right next to me. Standing I right next it. to her, right outside of their out of their bus on the ramp of Old Giant Stadium. That's there. right. Yep. That's right. So All good right, stuff. Dad. Good memories. Thanks, Paul. You the man. Good to talk All to right. you. Good right, to talk Dad. to both See of you. Pal. See you. See you, man. Yeah, Phil. that's a crazy Big day. Phil. Big Phil down memory lane. What a cool father son moment, though. I mean, yeah. like as yeah. a dad. Oh, those people are, praising you about your job in front of your kid. I mean, that's that, that's really cool. Really cool. I can remember walking up the ramp and. Um, you know, the old Giants Stadium, you yeah. can see the team buses. They were right there on the ramp. Yeah. So, I mean, it was the Cowboys, and they were the defending Super Bowl champions. And it's, you know, Troy Aikman and Emmitt Smith and Michael Irvin. And they were like, even, you know, for me, even my dad, Phil Sims, won two Super Bowls. I was still like, whoa, there's the Cowboys, you know. Yeah. And uh, I can still remember seeing Jerry, uh, Jimmy Johnson, seeing my dad and, like, hopping off the bus because to he was going to come, gonna come over and, and say something to dad. That's so awesome. that was cool. It was yeah. really cool, yeah. Um, all right, got to read, okay? First off, the Peter King podcast, okay? Got a big, big week for Peter King on his podcast. He's got uh, Brandon Cooks on as a guest. That's always entertaining. I mean, you can always count on Peter King having big-time guests, all right? And then has an interesting guest, and Ryan O'Callaghan, ex-offensive lineman, played at Cal, uh, has recently, you know, come out as being a homosexual um, and really just goes through the struggles of having to hide that and kind of, you know, uh, be secret about it because it's so taboo in the NFL world as we know. So I'm sure that's going to be a great interview as well. Check that out. The Peter King Podcast. Always a good listen. Peter's the man. He always gets top-notch guests. Um, all right. Now, I got another read because Big Phil skipped 
skipped us a little bit. I got to promote the uh, Rugby World Cup, okay? That's yep. coming up on NBC Sports Gold, okay? Uh, the Rugby World Cup begins Friday, September 20th through November 2nd. It's from Japan, 20 countries, all 48 matches on NBC Sports Gold, 22 exclusively only on the gold of NBC. And then the U USA, 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 <laughs> they're in Pool C, the group of death. They are there along with England, France, Argentina, and Tonga. So you better be ready, USA. Get your shit straight. Rugby World Cup, tune in. They're in the group of death. Let's see how they do. Um, so there's that. All right. What continent is Tonga on? It's not on a continent. You're trying to trick me there. You're a jerk. It's an <laughs> island in the Pacific. What an asshole you are. Did they tell you to say that to me? Maybe. Yeah, they did. I did. I'm that's not such really a, a bad guy. That's such a Pete question. I know you're not it that kind Pete. of guy. Yeah, it was Pete, not Matt. He yeah, he's going, he, he's, uh, he's going, Chris isn't that smart. He's a dumb blonde. He's a dumb blonde, and he won't he's know He's trying this. to figure out if it's part of Asia or Australia. Pete. It's not a what continent. Is it? Oceania? What? That's not a continent. Shut up. We have both of you. Okay, we got business to get down to here. Yes. We got... Uh, the, the, the next deep dive. Yes, the next deep dive. Let's Niners, go. Bengals. All right, Niners, Bengals. Niners offense. Yeah? <sighs> yeah. 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 Offense, please? I went back and watched the, the, the first touchdown. Right. And they disguised it so well where the guy came from. And if you remember watching it, he snuck out of the uh, out of bunch formation. It was the Sammy Watkins play from a week before with the yeah, Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, all of a sudden he's 20 yards behind the defense. I had to rewind it like five times to find where he came from. Yes. I, Kyle was so well invented disguised. that play, as I think I told you on the Monday podcast. He invented it. And you he said that like, like two days ago. I think yeah. we were sitting here. I'm like, did he really? And I he promise really you. that good? I was watching that yeah. play and thinking, all right, Chris is right. He, he, uh, that was sneaky. He, he did. He invented it. And just for a little... You know, back history with the story in itself. Wanted to run the play as the Houston uh, Texans offensive coordinator. He's working for Gary Kubiak. All right, yeah. I'll, I'll peel back the curtain a little bit. He wanted to do it. Kubiak wasn't comfortable with it. You know, it never been done before. Kyle's a young guy. Just didn't trust him. Whatever. I don't want to do it. I want to do it. We're good. We don't need to do stuff like that. So Kyle goes to the Redskins with his father, Mike Shanahan. He's the offensive coordinator for the Redskins. Houston Texans come to town. First drive of the game, runs the play, 80-yard touchdown. You know, just that's a cool little backstory to the play. And really, yeah. almost every team in football has it now, and I see it a handful of times every week with, awesome. uh, with teams doing it. Either way, that was a display, mm -hmm. as you saw. Yes. I mean, they cracked the code. Yeah. It was a total, total just picked apart the Bengals' defense. And that's the thing that's amazing about Shanahan. When he gets a beat on the defenses you're running and he mm -hmm. can start to go, ooh, when I get in this formation, they do this. Yeah. And when I get in that formation, I, they do that. That's when he kills you. And that's basically what he did. Uh, you know, I wrote the first two touchdowns were just the perfect play for the perfect defense. Yeah. It didn't matter if it was you or me or whatever at quarterback. Guys are wide open. Wide open. Mm -hmm. um, Jimmy G did have a, a, you know, a, a troubling interception. I think uh, you said full tropic thunder. Full tropic thunder. That's yeah. my phrasing there. Okay, I say that anytime people do teams do full stupid shit. Yeah. Okay, where I just go, what? There were like five bangles there. Yes. Yeah. 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 And uh, there was. There was like five bangles there. I don't know what he's doing. And the best part about it is Shanahan in the background when I'm watching film. You could see him on the sideline, like <laughs> as the ball's in the air, his hands are up in the air, like, why would you throw it there? Everybody's there. Um, but. Few things that just jump out to me, Paul, because this doesn't have to be long. With an ass whooping like that, you don't yep. need much. Um, I don't think the Bengals front seven is very impressive. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing I talk about. 49ers O line is a bad matchup for the Bengals, and will be a, bad, a tough matchup for any defense because the what, what they've done, Lynch and Shanahan and San Francisco, is they found a good blend of big athletic linemen. You know, and I think the thing that I like about Kyle, Kyle, of course, is famous for the inside-outside zone. They've added a few different run schemes to their, their, their repertoire this year, too, that I think are going to keep people off balance, which I really like. But, you know, the, the Bengals want to win with speed up front. Mm -hmm. The 49ers, just, they're athletic enough to, to, to match the speed of those, like, faster type of D linemen. I mean, they do play in a division with the Seahawks and the Rams. Right. So they're, they're, you're not going to surprise them with speed up front. And uh, I think they have the size and power when you want to get big to move you out of the way, too. This is a lot of compliments. I have one sheet I know. that is Niners against Bengals. But the very last sentence, it's like you thought you were going to sneak it in before moving on to Niners D against Bengals offense, is kind of troubling. Yeah. Jimmy G, drop back pass game, 
Only question of this offense. Only question I got. That's and that's major. It, it is major. I mean, it is. Now, you know, if there's an offense that can get away with it to a degree, it is them because of the way they run the ball and their play action passes and What's all that stuff. What's the biggest style. question you have? Well, uh, I still am not sold that he's hitting on all cylinders at this point. Okay. You know, like I said, it had been easy to play quarterback in that last game. Now, did he right. do some good things? I'm not trying to take anything away from him. I'm holding him to the standard of the 49ers want to go to the playoffs and win a playoff game right now. You know, and if they want to do that, of course, along the road, and it might be this week against the Pittsburgh Steelers, they might not be able to run the ball. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying I'm not sure if I'm in the trust tree all the way with Jimmy G yet to where, oh, we can't run the ball? Don't worry, coach. I'll dice them up and go 25 for 32 for 290 and three yeah. touchdowns, and we'll still win the game. I don't think we're there yet. But the good thing is, is he's got the flexibility of that run game and that offense, and their defense plays good, too, to where he doesn't need to force it to make it happen quite yet. That's for sure. Right. And I can't believe how many times I've noticed just this week after listening to you talk about how important it is to get under center. Yeah. Because I love the fact that so many people are in the shotgun. Right. Because it feels like it's easier yeah. to play quarterback in the shotgun. Yeah, okay. But the play action from under center is so much better when you keep an eye out You're for it. You're so, seeing it a little more, right? You're, now yeah. After I've opened your eyes to it, you start to see how much more effective it is. If you picture when you're in the shotgun, yeah. if everybody at home, yeah. a little quick ride of the running back right. makes the guys freeze for a moment. Exactly. But when you're under center and take those three big steps, like you're going to hand it off to the running back, the amount of flow you get and the confusion And more create, downhill. Yeah, yeah. You know, so like I, you're saying, with the shotgun stuff, the, the, line, the linebackers are going to almost slide sideways exactly. instead of coming up real You aggressive. can recover from the little hesitation that gives you. Right. It's hard to recover when three or four guys are sold on a second and a half fake. So yep. Thank you for pointing that out. No problem. Yeah, I'm, everything I'm here, looks different. I'm now. here to do that. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, I think any offense that doesn't have that, they're missing out on a big part of uh, finding ways to, to gash people. Niners defense, Bengals offense. Yeah, quickly. this this will be quickly. I mean, the 49ers D-line, first off, is the real deal. I think that's one thing we got to talk about. Truly eight deep, uh, versatile. If they want to get big and go, if they play, if they play the Cowboys, they're going to go, fine. We got, mm -hmm. we got four big guys we can put on here and, and make things tough. If they play the Kansas City Chiefs and go, we need quick and we need to get after Patrick Mahomes, they can do that too. Right. And I think that's what's exciting about their D-line. Very versatile. Their front seven is pretty damn impressive as far as speed-power combination. I really think it's one of the better, deeper, more talented ones in all of football. I think that's really uh, big for them. You know, John Ross is a legit weapon. That's just one thing that jumped out at me as a positive of the Bengals. Again, Andy Dalton. Uh, you know, I, I wrote, he, he, this, this is one thing that just jumps out to me about Andy Dalton. Really, the second week in a row, he's just not going to win you games, but he will lose them. He will lose them. And he, he, listen, they were overmatched early on, but when they realized they had to get in the shootout, you know, he started to open up and he threw a dumb interception and then it just snowballed from there and then the game was over. Um, but the 49ers D, I think, is one of the stories that's going to go unnoticed in football right now. They're, they are really good. They're well-coached. Uh, they run the Seattle scheme, which can be a little predictable, but they have enough change-ups for me to where I go, oh, okay, okay, you're not too predictable here every play. Uh, only question I have is, again, their ability to play man-to-man. -man. And just against the high-octane offenses. Because corners, because safeties. Cause yeah, because of, of the corners. I mean, uh, they have the Akilah Witherspoon, who I like, Richard Sherman, who I like. But I'm just saying, if like, the Bengals had John Ross and A.J. Green, I don't know, that could have been an interesting day at the office when they wanted to go man-to-man. -man. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's, again, I'm not like I'm concerned. I'm just going, I'm not sure I'm in the trust tree quite yet yeah. to go, oh, they're legit, and they'll be able to match up against any wide receiver unit in football. Not all the way in the, in the trust tree, but, and I asked you this question earlier, so I think I know the answer, but it feels like just from listening to you, yeah. I can block out that I think you said you like Seattle best. It sounds like you like San Francisco best. Well, I probably have some bias there. I'm excited about what I see from the 49ers because we're seeing marked improvement, and here they are 2-0, and and it mm -hmm. is my buddy, and, of course, I want him to win, and I get that. You know, the Rams, I think that's why it's like we're kind of like, oh, the Rams are doing the Rams right. things again. No big deal. And Seattle, oh, they're doing Seattle things again. So I guess I am probably am a little more excited about the, the 49ers just because – it's just a new topic and a new team to inject into the, the conversation. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Baltimore offense. Baltimore offense. Against an NFC West defense in the Cardinals. We talked about it a couple days ago and raved about what Lamar Jackson did. Yes. Statistically, you've had time to study what he did. I yeah. took a glance at it as well. Cool. So let, let's get right to Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Your headline there, your 
film deep dive headline from him. It's just uh, we're, we're seeing a guy grow right in front of us right? as far as the thrower, right? I mean, he missed a few throws in the game. I yeah. get that. But he made some other ones where I went, damn, that's, that's a throw right there. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he has had a number of them the first two weeks where I've just gone, oh, hey, say what you want. I mean, that's, that's top notch. That's like big time throws right there in the tight windows or back shoulders or the throw down the sideline to win the game to, yeah. to Hollywood Brown, right? Third, third and 11. Third yeah. and 11, yep. Yeah. Um, I think the one thing schematically that jumps out to me is they get such good looks, and I kind of wrote this at the top where, where I go. The Ravens get such good looks, to, good looks to throw the ball into, and they're gonna and he's gonna continue to put up numbers with these looks that he's throwing the ball into. Mm -hmm. And why? I just wrote a quick, quick thing between personnel sets, some of their motions and shifts. Uh, they do they 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 what they basically do to you because of that. They make it hard on you to get compl complicated because defenders, oh, it's a shift, it's a motion. Okay, this guy's going this way. You know how defensive coaches are. They're not going to want to put too many things into a defensive player's, you know, mm -hmm. okay, we're in cover three. Oh, they shifted over here. We're going with the wheel blitz. and blah, 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 blah. Oh, the ball snapped and somebody misses and the communication's wrong and all of a sudden there's a receiver wide, running wide open down the middle of the field. Or right. you don't get a guy in a gap in the run game. So it's a little bit of the Cam Newton effect where – when Cam was in his prime, you're kind of tied a little bit. You're a little fisticuff to but what you can do on the defensive side of the ball because, mm -hmm. one, I'd like this to be gap sound against a really good running team. Two, man, their quarterback can run. And three, they come out in three tight ends. And then it's, you know, one tight end. And then it's four receivers. And then it's two running backs and two tight ends and one receiver. And you're just like, whoa, it's all over the place. And I do think that you have to be somewhat careful as a defensive coordinator right. because if you do too much, you're going to get your ass gashed. And I think that's, uh, I think, you know, part of the Lamar greatness that will not go on a stat sheet, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And another thing that won't go on a stat sheet, and tell me if, if you think I'm seeing this the right way, but yeah. what really stood out to me in addition to the throws, and I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this, but when it's not a rollout, when it's not a play action, yeah. when he is either dropping mm -hmm. straight back or a little fake and then getting straight back. Right. He gets to the top of his drop so deep. He does. And so quickly. Yeah. And the moment he's there, in a very similar way that Breeze does, he hits the top of his drop and his balance and his rhythm, he's ready to go any throw on the field as well as any quarterback I've seen. He is. Outside of Breeze with that balance yeah, he gets there at the and top. It's, it's I'm not ready. saying he's as good as Drew. No, I'm I know what you mean, he's though. The second best quarterback in the league, but. His rhythm and balance and footwork and speed and getting to the top of his drop yeah. and being ready to throw a 20-yard out or a 5-yard under, whatever the play requires, is as good as anybody. I, I, I don't disagree with you there. And then when he does, he gets into that, top, that spot at the top of his drop. So and quickly. his feet are there, and you're right, he's in great balance. And he's, uh, you know, almost standing straight up with just a slight yeah. knee bend, right? And a little bit of forward lean. Right. And he can just flick it. Right. And, you know, again, people, when you go, oh, it just seems like it's a flick of the wrist. Usually when it's just a flick of the wrist, it means you're doing things so mechanically the right way and everything that mm -hmm. the ball just pops out of your hand because it's effortless. Like, right. it's just bam. And you go, bam, that was 25 yards. And that really cut through the air. Like, uh, he is capable of that. I'm with you. You know? There was a few throws like the errant ones we talked about. Like, there was like two or three throws where I go, damn, you know, you hit that, you know, yeah. whatever. And, and again, I'm not expecting him to be perfect. And Is the there only, anything about his motion that bothers you? I, it's not the motion. I think it's more of his front leg that I noticed. And the plays he misses, mm -hmm. he does not really step into it. And, like, uh, I'm going to jib it for a second just to show it real quick. All right, John McDonald? But one thing he does, just yep. one thing, my only stand-up of the day right here. Yeah. Okay, and you're right. He's very much like, uh, damn, this ball's slick. Yeah. You know, he's very much always like right here, right? And it's just whoosh, yeah. whoosh. I mean, he's got such a flexible arm. But when he's really throwing it perfect, he just gets a little step to go with the ball. When he, when he misses, like he missed a deep crosser one time, guy was wide open, he just he doesn't get any step. It's almost like he just does this. Right? He just does, or it's a real tiny step, and it's all it gets to instead of being like, so he does this, and then he kind of gets stuck underneath the ball. Yeah. And the ball goes up yes. in the air a little bit. Yeah. Where when he does like what you're saying, and we see the really good ones, it's just a little step out there to then he gets it, and then the ball is here more instead mm -hmm. of like this. And that's just one thing that jumped out to me. But you see that for a second? Yeah. The ball? Yep. You, you mentioned flexible arm. Right. And to me, a lot of times it, 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 it's so whippy that it, it comes out in a really nice way. Yeah. But sometimes, when, because his arm is flexible, like you said, right. I feel like there's a little loop where it comes back. Like if you, if you too, froze it, 
Yeah. It would be back here. I think you're instead right. Instead of right here. Yeah, that's it true. just gets a little bit out there. A little too much. And that's how you miss high sometimes. You definitely can. It's too like it's like a you know the analogy I would always use is like a you know you're 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 on the you're on the tee box with your driver and you're just the, the back swings too much. Yeah. Like just tighten it up just a little bit. Right. And you won't lose control of it. You know, right. you know I'm going to throw it. I'm going to hit it 350. Yeah. No, just 320 is good. Right. And 320, we're going to get a birdie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Thinking about uh, drivers and all that, it's nice to have whip. And it's nice when his whip is through. Yes. When his whip comes back like that sometimes, I feel like it, it, I, it can affect his accuracy. I think a that's bit. a very, very fair point. High. There's no doubt about that. You want this slick ball just back? Just leave it there. Yeah. That's all right. That, okay. damn, that thing is slick. I know. Um, I think that's the big thing overall, though. You know, just. Um, I'm very impressed with Mark Andrews. Hollywood Brown is a game changer. He's a, wow. he's a game changer. Yeah. I mean, he's just, he's going to make, not only with all the things we talked about, that handicap of defense when you play them anyways because of Lamar and their shifts and their ability to run the football, but now you have to worry about him and leaving him man-to-man. And through two games, he's going to get to the point now where defensive coordinator is going to go, gosh, okay, who am I going to put on him? Who do I trust right. him? How many times a game do I really want to go man-to-man? Because they're going to take shots. Right. And it's just a matter of time before they hit one. And that was the third and 11 that, that, that they converted. And we, we always have the right. rhetorical question, oh, it's third and 15, it's third and 10, third and 20. You got a good call on third and long. And on two different occasions, on third and 20, Jackson got third and he got 19 yep. on a quarterback draw, which right. helped him get a field goal. Yes. So that's a very good the call. The run up the middle there was great. On third right. and 20. Right. But on third and 11, you have Hollywood Brown manned up and just take a shot deep. So they, it, it's not rhetorical with them. What's a good call on third and 15? I know. They might have a couple good answers. They're, they're, they're not going to let you off the hook. That's for sure. They're not going to get a draw or like things like that. Right? You're gonna, they're going to go for it. That's the thing I like about the Ravens. Like we talked about a little on Monday, really good offenses put pressure on you. They make you defend the whole field. doesn't always have to be the same way in which you do it, but the Ravens do that. Right. And at the, just the base level, they're very good at doing that right now. You still have time in this game for, uh, for yeah. Kyler Murray? Yeah, I got, I got some Kyler stuff. Because that was, that was pretty awesome to it, watch, too. It, it was pretty damn awesome, is yeah. right. I mean, uh, I, I think the, the thing that jumps out to me more than – hey, first off, I'll give credit. Like, Cliff Kingsbury's offense, Yeah. do I want to see more? Sure. But the offense has everything you need to be successful, and he's got a few little tricks and things he does here and there just to keep you honest. I would like to say they got underneath the center twice in the game, mm -hmm. and they were two for two for 60 yards off go. of – Play action passes. Yep, yep. So there's another example. Please get underneath the center. They ran the play that you just talked about with Kyle Shanahan for one of the plays. He came out, play action. The guy acted like he was in a block down. Mm -hmm. He snuck out the back door. He threw a big pass to him. Right. So always cool to see that. I mean, you, wrote, you see what I wrote at the very, very bottom? I don't know if you even have this one. I wrote, Murray is awesome. He's a baller. Okay? That's where we're going with this conversation. Yes. He's, he's phenomenal. Um, I, I mean... I guess, where do I want to go? I'm just going to read it verbatim. Here we go. Things I love about Kyle Murray. He wants to throw first. When he cocks it to throw, he's always ready to get that first guy like right away, right? That first read. I'm going to be ready to throw. And if he doesn't like it, he pulls it. And then what I love about him is when he pulls it, he doesn't look like, oh, let me look at the rush and see what's going on and I'm going to try to run. No, he pulls it. He might scan up the rush just a second to go, okay, am I okay? Is anybody around me? And then his eyes go downfield. And he looks to strike. And he's just amazing with that. I love that he can reset in the pocket. He stays patient. And he doesn't run until he really has. Right. And his arm and his release are just out of this world good. They really are. I mean, just some absolute unreal throws. He's a phenomenal back shoulder thrower already. I've seen enough already to say that. You know, go routes, anything down the sideline, anything down the field is uh, – is like cream of the crop already where I feel very confident in saying that about Kyler Murray. You said you have one issue with the Cardinals offense. It's the protection? Yes, their protection. I do I do think Baltimore exposed it a little. One, they're not physically that great up front, right? So they just get beat man-to-man -man sometimes. Just mm -hmm. their men are not good enough. Right. But two, um, I think Cliff Kingbury is, you know, he's going to learn a little bit like, oh, gosh, these NFL blitzes come from a lot of different ways, and i got to find some other ways to protect, you know, 
I, I can't let five guys come and they get a free guy on my quarterback. I just can't do that. Right. You know, really good offenses, like I was telling you, with a really good quarterback, five guys come, ho-hum. We'll figure out that. The back will get them, or maybe we'll sort it out with all five linemen. Like Brady, that's what they would do. They're going to go, oh, you're going to bring five? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> you dreaded bring five, five rush. and then I'll have five linemen to block him, and then my back will get out. And you're going to be really screwed because he's going to be. I'm going to have time to throw it, and he's going to be one on one on a backer. So those are the things uh, that I look at. That I, that concerns me. Their O line just dealing with blitz pickups and things like that, and then the red zone offense. Mm -hmm. The red zone offense, I think, is there is no red zone offense. They just call plays still. And there, and I think again, this is Cliff Kingsbury. What is, I'm impressed with what I'm seeing so far. So mm -hmm. I'm not trying, but this is something I think his offense will have to grow into a little bit. You know, New England. You know, the Saints. Other teams, they have a true red zone offense where there's like these are core plays that they don't run in the middle of the field. They pertain to the 15-yard line and in because defenses change and they have certain rules that they abide to down here. And I just don't see that from Arizona. And that's why they've had a hard – they've been a field goal fest. Right. You know, their touchdowns in the first game came from a big throw to David Johnson and then they had one drive where they got down in the red zone and scored a touchdown. But they've had a lot of field goals. And it was the same thing with this game. You know, they got one touchdown down there, but they settled for three different field goals. And that did, ultimately was the difference in the football game. And that, the best thing that they could do to, to improve upon that, so like in three or four weeks you're not talking about, and the red zone, they just run a bunch of plays. Yeah, they just, they just got to find a group of plays, and they're going to have to study the rest of the NFL a little bit and just steal some things from people. I don't know what else to say other than that, but they got to find a group of plays that they go, wait, we know this is just for this area of the field because defenses are a little limited in what they do down there. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the most part, as a general rule, when you get to like the 15 and in, it's usually shell coverage or it's some type of blitz. And you have to be prepared for one of those two things. Right. You know, teams don't play single safety man a whole lot once you get into the 10 or 15 yard line. So you're gonna see, you know, quarters, Tampa two, or you're gonna see, oh, we're gonna go all out blitz and there'll be no safety in the middle of the field. Uh, and and the, you just have to have a plan for those things, I think basically is what I'm trying to say. And we have one more to get to. Yeah. And we have to get to this. Kansas City offense oh, against the Raiders defense. You know, my point Especially the second here. quarter. Yeah. And I had written down, highlighted, and circled, and your dad brought it up. Kansas City offensive line is way beyond good. He's taking drops seven, eight, nine yards deep and just kind of looking around, maybe stepping one way or the other. I know. It's, it's not a great D-line with the Raiders, but it's it doesn't true. matter. You're right. It's an NFL D-line. It's an NFL D-line. And the Chiefs O-line, this is where, you know, there's been years, and this is where I trust Andy Reid, where there's been years where they lose all linemen, even, even when he's in Philadelphia or Kansas mm -hmm. City, and they just go, oh, man, their all line's going to be in trouble this year. Well, he's an O-line expert. Right. And that's where it's hard to, for a guy like me or you to evaluate teams sometimes because we go, oh, they lost a few old linemen. But, you know, guys like Andy Reid are like, well, I got two in the practice squad that I know are really f***ing good, and I'm mm -hmm. going to put them on the start, and we're not going to miss a beat. Right. So that's why I let that guy go. And uh, they're just so well coached, but you're, you're right. They are like a, the red wall back there. You know, I mean, the Colts got the blue wall. They got the red wall as far as pass protection. And they're just, they're amazing to watch. Best compliment you could pay Patrick Mahomes. That is based off of what you saw on that day. That uh, was great. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, specifically, though. Specifically, I just the... <laughs> The effortlessness to throw balls 40, 40 yards 50 down. yards downfield. The intermediate, I know. Right? I mean, I just yeah. never, you know, it's like Dad said, oh, okay, I'll slide here, I'll slide there, which, okay, is credit to the offensive line. Yeah. But then it still goes back to, like, gosh, oh, oh there goes a 40-yard laser down across the field. Completion. Mm -hmm. Oh, there goes a 50-yard bomb in the air. Completion. Right. You know, they – yeah, I wrote even some things down. I wrote, like, you know, Chiefs, even when you stop them, you don't stop them. Usually there was stuff there to be had. They just, like, he missed the throw mm -hmm. or he got greedy. Right. There was somebody open maybe for a 10-yard gain, and he said, nah, there's a 70-yarder that I could hit here. Let me throw it down there. Mm -hmm. You know, th that's really where they stalled early in the game. I wasn't going, oh, gosh, the Raiders are doing really good stuff. They, got, they figured it out. Right. No, I was just, you know, it was one of those where – you watch the film, you go, oh, I can see. Yeah. There was plays to be had there in the first quarter. They didn't quite get it. But, again, it just goes back to the pressure they put on you. Mm -hmm. Motions, formations, the play design, the players that go along with it. Uh, you know, along with the Raiders defense that's not that talented, I do think they tried to do too much. Again? There was, you know, yeah. think about the one, 
there's the Demarcus Robinson seam route up the side. Nobody's in the screen when he mm -hmm. throws in the ball for the touchdown because what happened is there was three receivers to the left. They ran a motion and motioned another guy to the four sides, and the Raiders are trying to communicate when the motion goes because, you know, they were in one call, but now it was going to change, and they were going to try to make another call, and all of a sudden you don't get it all communicated to all 11 guys, and you have an uncovered guy going down the field against the Kansas right. City Chiefs. That's where I say when you have like a really great offense, you better be careful about being too cute because if they're creative mm -hmm. and they move a lot of people and have formation shifts and motions like that, your creativeness is going to get like a few smacks in the face. Right. And I think that came back to bite them in the butt a little bit uh, as well. We talked about their offensive line and how really underrated it is for him to take the kind of drops he takes and have that kind of time. Left, left tackle Eric Fisher out four to six weeks. How, how big of a deal is that? Yeah, uh, again, and I'm not even sure who they're going to have filling in for it. Yeah, it's Cam, Cam Irving, Irving, which yeah. is going to work fine. That's right. I mean, Cam Irving is, you know, was the ex first round pick who got drafted as a center uh, out of Florida That's State. Right. Yeah. Okay. And Andy Reid picked him up because he saw something. And Cam mm -hmm. Irving played tackle in college at one point, too. So this will not be a huge adjustment for him. Uh, and, you know, Andy will, if he feels like he struggles, he'll find ways to hide it and right. do things to help him out. That's where Andy's great. But they're just amazing. And there's the one thing I noticed, too. You know, even when, when you play the Chiefs, even when you do call the right defense, this is just so scary about them. You know, as we've all known now, I'm not telling anybody anything new here, but even when you play the right defense, you're still, it's 50-50 whether you're going to stop them. Because of? Because they're just so f***ing good. Yeah. I mean, he's so good. Right. He's so good. And then the talent of the players and just the fact that they do put that pressure on you, you go, man, so there's some plays you go, well, this is great defense. Right. Look at this. Oh, damn, it's still a 30-yard game. Right. Because he just made it the perfect throw. Right. You know? Doing this with you once or twice a week is forcing me to, to watch uh, a little bit more and uh, a, a little more closely. Cool. Taking back and going, look. And what I noticed about, what, what I wrote down about Mahomes, yeah. offensive line, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And as ex-quarterbacks, it's just fun to watch him because of the kind of throws he can make. It is. Because he's so talented, because the old line's good, because Andy Reid, we give him so much credit for how he schemes and does formation and puts him in a good position, I don't think we've given enough credit, or I didn't give him enough credit, him being Patrick Mahomes, for locating what is the best matchup and getting it to him right away. That, that cognitive, the recognition at snap, and the ball goes where it's supposed to go. Yes. In addition to yeah. the old line being good, and his all arm is ridiculous, his coach is awesome. Yeah. His recognition at the snap and getting it to the right spot is much better than I gave him credit yeah, for. You're right. That's where it's special. It'd be, that's where it can go from like, okay, we have a great system and it's great offense, but you're right. They're not afraid to play matchup football at times where they just go, our guy's better than your guy, right. and we're going to send him on a go route, right. or we're going to throw him a 20-yard out route. And quarterback's going to see that before and the snap. And he's going to see it, right? And he's, he's, so I, I do. I love that because not everybody's into that. There's some teams we could go through with football where I would go, damn, yeah, I mean, that's a cool play, but – Gosh, there was a matchup on the backside one-on-one yeah. -on -one right. that he beat him, and you got to like play your guy there. Yeah. And I don't think they've lost sight of that fact, even within their great creative offense and all that. They still go, oh, you have a slow linebacker on Kelsey? Screw this scheme play over there. Yeah. Just play Kelsey. He'll beat him. You'll throw the strike, and it'll all work out. Right. And there's nothing wrong with doing that either. Um, all right, that's it for our film Deep Dives. That's all we got to say. I didn't watch the Chiefs defense in this game. I can't watch all the film in the world in 48 hours. So <laughs> that's all I can say about that. Um, I got one more read from Roto World Football Podcast, okay? Yep. New episode every Sunday. They do a recap. Monday um, is like the waiver wire stuff, uh, all the fantasy stuff, all that kind of crap, you know. Um, and then Wednesday starts, sits, right? You can listen to my man Josh Norris and company. They'll tell you where where to get your fantasy team roster correct. And then Thursday they go through matchups. You know matchups they like and why they want to play these guys and their logic behind it. They're all over the fantasy world and bring a lot of great realistic football points to the table as well. Again, don't <laughs> text me and ask me <laughs> about fantasy football. Just watch the Roto World Football Podcast and you'll get all the damn answers and you won't waste my time and I won't have to disrespect to you by not answering. All right? People texting you? Like, is, oh, is your number it's out there? Really like a, oh, it's like my friends usually. Oh, it's yeah. a Sunday morning or Saturday night thing. Yeah. Like I got nothing going on but now fix my fantasy team. Right. I, I want to go, why do you guys even play? Because you're like, it's not like you're doing it. 
I'm doing it, and you want to just, what, take the credit so you can, like, go to the bar with your friends and be like, look, I'm awesome. I played him this week. People are addicted to, to checking their fantasy I know. on Sundays. Really. I know. It drives me crazy. A certain rush with yes, that, Yes, it drives me crazy. All right, we're just talking about the Chiefs. We don't have to make anybody feel good about the 2-0 and team. There's nope. some 0-2 teams. Yep. That it's up to you as we put a, a wrap on the show to help people feel good about an well, 0-2 team. When you talk about 0-2 teams that I can make you feel good about, the yeah. Miami Dolphins are, no, no, no they absolutely don't count. not. No, they don't count. All right, so here's our, all, list. Here's our all our 0-2 teams. Steelers, Jaguars, Broncos, Bengals, Panthers, Jets, Redskins, Giants, Dolphins. Okay, I'm just going to tell you this. Go ahead. Pick two or three. I'm going to pick two. I'm just yeah. going to leave pick this two. graphic up. I'm not, there's nothing I can say. I mean, hey, Giants, it's cool. You're going to have Daniel Jones. That's cool. But the, the, you can look at the future. But I don't think it's going to translate to, like, a lot of wins and wins. Dolphins, sorry. There's nothing I can make you feel better for. Washington Redskins, all I can say is, you know, maybe you'll lose again and then you get the Dwayne Haskins era started, okay? The Jets, sorry. You're going to go 0-5 or 0-6 because you got to play New England, the Cowboys, another tough game, and then New England again. I'm sorry. Nothing I can say there. The Carolina Panthers, I'm not giving up total hope yet. No. I'm not. They, you know, their team has played well the first two weeks. It's been Cam Newton who's played like shit. Yeah. There's no other way I can say it. I'm expecting him to be able to turn that around. We have seen, what, seven years in a row, an 0-2 team make the playoffs. So, six years. Sorry. Six. So, will this be the seventh? I don't know. But if you made me pick one team that I would say, ooh, that could be the team, the Panthers are still one of those teams I'd look at. The Bengals, sorry. They'll be fun to watch in some games. I don't have anything positive to say right now, okay? Broncos... <laughs> You're going to play some defense. I just don't think there's enough offense there. Sorry, that's the end of that conversation. Jacksonville Jaguars, I got something positive. I'm yep. not giving up on them yet. I'm hoping if, if Jalen Ramsey will be a part of that, mm -hmm. and if Jalen Ramsey does stay there, I still say watch out for them. They could have won that game last week. And Gardner Minshew is good enough if they can run the ball and play defense to where they might be able to give themselves a fighting chance at least by the time Nick Foles comes back. If they right. can be around 500 – to where maybe they can finish a nine and seven or something, you know, like that. Even without the best defensive maybe. player? If they don't have Jalen Ramsey, that yeah. would probably change. So we can tune into that next week to see right. where we go there. Right. Pittsburgh Steelers, sorry. Got nothing to say. It's just I, I don't good. see enough right now to give me a glimmer of hope. And especially with the Big Ben news, uh, yeah, I just I think it's trouble. So two teams that I would just say to make you feel better, Panthers, Jaguars. Pan yeah. Okay. yeah, I think those are the two teams that I feel like. And the Giants, it's cool to see Daniel Jones. But that, that, those would be my two most positive teams right there. Panthers, Jags, either yeah. one make the playoffs? I'm going to say right now, no. Yeah. I think this is the year that 0-2 streak might end, actually. I don't think it's going to happen. And, I mean, of course, I'm concerned about Cam because he hasn't thrown the ball well. And, then of course, they're saying the foot injury is still bothering him a little bit. So uh, that just doesn't sound good on, on all accounts. All right. All right, that's it. That's a podcast. I can't talk anymore. Subscribe, rate, review. Tell me how awesome or stupid I am. I don't care. We are going to do it. Ask me anything at some point here soon. They keep telling me that. Maybe they're just telling me that, so I keep saying this. And then you review and write questions. It's a deep tease. But Thursday, a deep tease. We're going deep. Uh, I got week three picks. My picks were pretty good last week. I was 10 and 6, and I know out of my three locks I picked betting, I believe I hit on two. And I know my scores. I had a few games where I was like, I pegged them pretty damn close. Straight up or spread? Uh, well, I was 10 and 6 straight up. I don't know what I was with the spread, but I know I had to pick three where I said this is the games I would bet on. Jacksonville was one because they were like nine and a half point underdogs to the Texans. They lost by a point. Um, damn it. Hold on. I got to pull it up. I had another good one, too, and I'm blanking. I'm choking here. They're playing the goodbye music. I know. Well, they're going to have to deal with it. Uh, that was one. Um, what was the other one? Oh, the Lions and the Chargers. Yep. The Chargers were favored. Yep. I said the Lions would win, so I hit on that, too. So you might make some money uh, either way. But either way, picks, picks tomorrow with Florio. It's a PFTPM unbutton collaboration. I'm done. I'm tired. I've talked enough. It's true. You the yes. man. Paulie Burmeister, you, thanks so much, as always, for uh, helping me out here. All right, everybody, peace out. Have a good day. Yo, yo, what's up? Come on, man. Subscribe on YouTube to Chris Sims Unbutton Podcast. I need you. Please hit the subscribe button, please.